Good morning. Good morning. And thank you for being here this morning and joining us for this work session. Um, first of all, Board of Commissioners, um, thank you all for all your hard work that you do. I just wanted to do that. I know you're promising wise, but thank you. Without y'all, I couldn't do this. So thank you. And also my directors and the, the entire body that's in this room. Um, public comment. We have a public comment this morning? Yes, ma'am. We do. Okay. All right, we have two um, citizens who signed up for public comment. I just want to remind you all of our process after you, you have three minutes to articulate your concerns. And after you hear the buzzer, we will set the, our uh, cell phone. Lisa has it set, so when the buzzer goes off, please wrap your sentences up. I ask that you please uh, present your, uh, mat, uh, your subject matter in a very um, calm and uh, manner. And with that being said, I'm not gonna go through a whole dialogue this morning. Mr. Pierce, please come up and um, give us your address and your subject matter is, and is court. Mm -hmm. So if you could just come on up, please. You. Oh. Are you in here with Mr. Pierce? I'm sorry. I'm usually hot to trot. Yeah, you are. Uh -huh. you are. Oh, Lord. <laughs> Larry, Larry Pierce, 4120 Van Sant Road, Douglasville, Georgia. Uh, I, I have some great news this morning. Uh, I got a phone call last night, and uh, uh, the coroner and I are going to make up. And she's going to take me to Las Vegas, and she's trying to get us through now, so y'all pay for it. Okay? Y'all pay for it. Uh, that, that's, my, that's my April Fool's joke, by the way. Uh -huh. But I do want to tell y'all the truth. I got written up on the diversion plan. Well, excuse me. Van Sant Road is a narrow road. And when we were all talking about semi-trucks a while back and people using the wrong road, Trust me, the shortest distance between two points, if you learn that in algebra and geometry, is a straight line. And they come over the bridge, they come down my road. There's no striping or nothing on the road. It's all gone from the corner of my property. The corner of my property is right here at the end of the county, right here. And then from there down, the nursery, the, the metal manufacturer, the guy across the street used to make air, uh, ducks for homes, and further on down around the curve to the cell tower, where it intersects 92, is barren. You come down the road and you hope you don't run off. There's no lines, there's no yellow. And for the first time in 45 years I lived there, they turned the machine off when they got to the corner, county. And that over here is city. But I just want to let you know the county painted it, and then they stopped right at the corner of my lot and turned the paint off, and the rest of the road is city. And that's the way it is. So they came out a while back, and Mr. Crow said, Larry, you got a lot of junk on your property. And if y'all go up here, y'all see people that collect stuff refer to it as junk. To us in our heart, it's not junk, okay? All right. So he said, stuff on the right is okay. Stuff on the left, you need to straighten up. So they wrote me up on this diversionary plan. It's kind of like a semi-criminal thing. You fill it out, and if you do bad, you pay $500. So I did good. He said, he said, take everything on the left. So I asked him, could I take everything on the left and put it on the right? He said, no, 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 no. You need to move it, clean it up. So I did. So I go downstairs because now they wrote something else up on me. And it's called special use permit. And I go downstairs and I sarcastically said, can I have a copy of it? The guy gives it to me. And then the other girl comes over and says, you need to go through the regular procedure. But you're not going to believe the last statement I'm going to make. I said, I'll bet y'all have a special use permit for chickens. She said, we do. I said, I got three. She said, well, you're okay. How much land you got? I said, an acre. You can have three to six. And then I said, I'll bet you got a special land use permit for a rooster. She said, we do. I said, well, we all know what roosters are for. Why do I need a permit? She said, well, you just do. I said, well, I'll tell you what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna let them all go, and they can roam around neighborhoods, then you can call animal control, come get them. But a special land use permit 
for a rooster, and I inherited it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Pierce. Little human goes a long ways. All right, we have um, Professor Janaski. Please come forward. The subject matter is Highway 5. Uh, John Tomaski, 6000 uh, Stewart Parkway, Douglasville. Good morning to all. Good morning. Uh, it is April 1st, uh, but uh, I have a very dispassionate and likely boring thing to uh, put on record simply. It's uh, regarding item number 25 on your agenda. That is the right turn lane for northbound traffic at Douglas Boulevard. <laughs> from Highway 5, and uh, uh, Mr. Valentin, to my observation, is a very knowledgeable, experienced, and professional individual, dispat very dispassionate, does, does the job by the book. Uh, I think he does a great job, and I'm sure I'm not going to say anything he doesn't already know, so I want to be clear as to that. Just indicating, number one, some citizen comment, and number two, getting it on record. The essential traffic problem in the county is there simply aren't enough through roads. You have various trenches, you have various obstacles, and even fairly minor roads, as long as they're through roads, handle a lot more traffic and heavier traffic than they were ever designed to carry. Specifically, uh, at that intersection of Highway 5 and Douglas Boulevard, adding that right turn lane is years late, and the problem has gone way beyond that by now. It's not going to make a bit of difference. You now have westbound traffic on Douglas Boulevard, approaching Highway 5, and the left turn lane, that traffic going to the stoplight to turn left onto Highway 5 South, is blocked now by left turns being made by either of <coughs> two lines of traffic going into the revamped strip mall, which is at the southeast corner. So <coughs> you can be in that lane, and you have to get into that lane from far back. You can be into that lane intending to make a left turn onto Highway 5, and you'll wait three, four traffic lights because it becomes blocked <coughs> by traffic in that lane, making left turns into either of the two entries into the revamped strip mall. So I just want to put on record that, number one, the money and effort that's going to go into that is just not going to make a difference. Your biggest problem now there is left turns into that strip mall, and at the major level, you just don't have the through roads, and you cannot put more traffic into this county without having gridlock. Thank you. Thank you so much, <coughs> Mr. Uh, Professor Janaski. We appreciate that. I'm quite sure I'll be back to a Valentine uh, so you chat with me regarding your concern. But I believe at this time, um, we need something done, and anything is better than nothing at this point. Um, but I'm just not sure. I, your logic may be, we may, you may be going in the right direction, but I certainly uh, believe that my um, director of transportation would have a better idea what's best for this county at this time. And it is. You're right, it's gridlock out there. I ride it every weekend, and I, we've just outgrown our shoes. But we're trying to see what we can do to uh, alleviate the pressure here in Douglas County. We have a lot of cars. And if you look on the weekends, a lot of those tags are not from Douglas County. They're from Alabama, um, and they're from South Fulton, Fulton County, and Cobb County. They love shopping here, so we love that as well. So I'm going to see what we can do to uh, relieve that pressure. Thank you, though. Really. Well, thank you, Dr. Jones. Mm -hmm. And uh, I do believe uh, the best man in this that uh, He's at the table. you can have is in that position to argue. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right, thank you. 
All right, we're going to move on, Board of Commissioners. We uh, you have the approval of the minutes. Please take a look at those minutes so we can approve accordingly tomorrow. We have uh, for tab number four, five, and six, six, we have proclamations tomorrow. So be prepared to listen to these proclamations and uh, we will vote accordingly. Uh, public hearing. Uh, tomorrow, we also have a public hearing in tab number seven to consider amending chapter five of the Douglas County Co Code of Ordinances related to the community and feral cats. We have our director, Mike Willem, here. If you could just brief us so we can be prepared to understand what we are, uh, this public hearing will entail. The ordinance revision will help us um, with community cats. And um, I want to define what a feral cat is. And that's what we're having a problem with in our community. When feral cats come into the shelter, we don't have an outlet for them. So a feral cat, um, there's three different types. There's total feral, they, they haven't had human contact. They're not going to allow human contact. Uh, Semi-feral, they have had some positive human contact but they're afraid of humans and they don't want to be touched. We have converted ferals that have past positive human contact. Often they are scared of an abandoned pet. Sometimes they'll come around um, and allow us to rehabilitate them and place them for adoption. Um, the problem is that we have too many cats and not enough homes. So when feral cats come in, a lot of people, they don't want to adopt those because uh, there's no provision in the ordinance that allows them to roam free. Um, the cause is a human neglect, particularly the failure to um, spay and neuter, and then um, abandoned pets. Uh, maybe somebody moves or and they can't take the pet with them and they've, they've went out and become semi-feral. Uh, the solution is as easy as one, two, three. A trap, each of the cats, transport them to the shelter, uh, neuter them. Uh, we would test, vaccinate, spay and neuter, um, perform an ear tip, which uh, allows us to identify them in the future as a spayed, neutered feral cat. Um, return the cat to the same place it was trapped under the care of a community uh, cat caregiver. And that would be somebody in the community that's willing to accept them back. And it, oftentimes communities or even <coughs> businesses uh, get together and feed the cats. Um, the benefits of TNR is to decrease the overall population. Um, by having them spayed and neutered, they can't reproduce. Um, it decreases objectionable behavior, um, yowling that they do to attract mates, um, roaming and spray of urine, which is a lot of complaints we get. Um, improves overall health of the cats in the neighborhood, not just the feral cats, but the other cats in the neighborhood too, because feral cats, they're properly <coughs> vaccinated, want spread disease. Um, it's the most effective and humane solution to problems with cat population, and it benefits the human population by holding back the wildlife in the area. They, they um, hunt rodents and decrease um, the rodent <coughs> population so you don't have raccoons and coyotes and, uh, coming in to, to feed off the rodents. <coughs> um, <coughs> excuse me. A lot of people just say, not, why does not eradicate the cats? Why can't we just trap them all and euthanize them? Well, it doesn't work. And no program is 100% effective. And it creates a vacuum effect. It allows the cats to move in from other areas and repopulate again. And your cat population will soon be as high as it was before because the rodents will come back, the cats will come back, the wildlife will come in. Um, if we do nothing, this is what happens. Uh, you just have a ton of cats. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, it's estimated that a pair of breeding cats and their offspring, in ideal conditions, that everybody breeding and surviving, could produce 420,000 offspring in a seven year period. The likelihood of having ideal conditions is not um, going to happen, but that's, you would have that many births and then some of those would die off, but you would have a very much, as we do now, a cat overpopulation problem. Um, some of the resources that I used uh, was Alley Cat Allies, uh, Fix Our Ferals, Feral Cat Coalitions, and Best Friends. Um, 
these uh, websites are useful in researching and looking at programs that have been successful in other areas. Uh, Jacksonville had a very successful program, um, and I've followed that program for many years, and they have decreased their feral cat population under okay. control. So how do we get started? Best Friends has helped us out a lot, and they recommend that we update our ordinances. And the ordinance changes would be defining um, what a community cat is and, and what the program entails. So um, return of the community cat has been sterilized and vaccinated for rabies. The location at which it was found shall not be considered abandonment since we, we have an abandonment clause in our ordinance. So we want to make sure that we're not um, going against our own ordinance. So that would not be considered abandonment. And we would return cats to communities where the communities accept this and there are caretakers willing to help feed them and house them. Um, community cats shall mean any free roaming cat that may be cared for by one or more residents of the immediate area who <coughs> is or known or unknown. A community cat shall be distinguished from other cats by being sterilized, vaccinated at the time of sterilization against the threat of rabies, ear tipped, and that just means you, you just cut off the tip of the ear in a straight line. That's the universal symbol for a, a feral cat that has been sterilized so we can easily identify them if they get captured again in the trap then we just shake them back out move on to the next one um, the community cat is exempt from licensing <coughs> if we should have licensing in the future uh, certain strain at large provisions chapter may be exempt from other provisions they would be exempt uh, from the leash law and allowed to run at large they're already there in the community they're already running around We've tried for years to trap them and remove them from the community, but they keep coming back. So it would just be a way to allow us to control the population now and, and get that population down, and that's that's what we're aiming to do. Um, a community cat caretaker would be defined as any person or persons that shall agree to act in accordance with the policies and procedures. Um, that would, you know, they would provide them with fresh water, food. Um, watch out for them. They can call the animal control if they're not being healthy, and we can call those cats from the colonies. Um, they shall not be considered owners or harbors or custodians. They're just caretakers. So they would be exempt from the ownership clause in our ordinance. Um, any impounded free roaming cat without identification um, shall not be subject to the 72 hour stray hold. So once we get a um, <coughs> free roaming cat in that is feral, um, we can sterilize those and send them right back out without having to wait for the three day stray hold. This allows us to um, accelerate our program because if we're having to hold them for three days for a stray hold, when we know they're not owned and they're going to go back out to the same community with a caretaker, it just allows us to get that flow going. This program would also help us with our euthanasia rate, our life release rate. I believe would go up to 90 to 95 percent because the majority of the animals we do euthanize at the shelter are feral cats. <coughs> and that's it. Okay. Any questions for the board commissioners or comments? Vice Chairman Robinson. Yeah, do. just more procedural. Um, the county attorney. I need to go get my coffee. Okay. <laughs> this is more just, um, I, I understand this is going to be a public hearing. Um, please distinguish the difference between a public hearing, where we're getting input from citizens, and a public meeting, where we're getting input from comments. Just, I want to make sure that I'm about to yeah. tomorrow. This is more of a And I, I guess the question, are you proposing ordinance changes tomorrow? That's why it's a public hearing as opposed to, uh, it's not the kind of meeting where you're just receiving information for public input. Is that correct? That is correct. So they're wanting to change the ordinance. That's why it's a public hearing. And so they're changing the local ordinance, um, the county's ordinance, correct? Correct. And specifically, um, what section does that follow? Do you know, Kim, how does that fall? Does she have one independent for animal control? Which it probably does, public safety, right? Yes, there is an animal control chapter five. Okay. And we specifically would be changing the definitions. Okay. And that is section five dash two. Okay. Um, and I do have a copy of this one that's changes in full. Okay. 
Um, but it would be 5-2 and 5-216. Um, so that defines that we're not abandoning the animals. 5-216 defines that what a community cat is. And 5-217 would give the community caretaker a definition. And 580A would exempt the feral cats from the three-day stray hold. If you, uh, com Commissioner, if you were to implement the program without the ordinance change, you'd be violating your own ordinance. Mm -hmm. And so my question is to do a public hearing, which is to give public notice. How many notices must we give? And have this, has that been done? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Okay. How many times? Oh, come on. We, we, adver we advertise um, twice for a public hearing at least two weeks before the public hearing. So two, so there's instances of two and instances <coughs> of three. What's the difference? Do you, either well, one of y'all can answer that. Well, there's the, the ones that are three are if they require specifically under state law. Yeah. This is not, this is uh, home rule, we all controlling their own ordinances. Mm -hmm. An ordinance change requires two advertisements in advance of the hearing. I think Lisa said two weeks out. Can we provide the notice already? Yes. In the legal order? Yes. Okay. Just look for confirmation. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, we thank you for quoting that. You know, we, we want to make sure that we keep doing Just tell us what the law is that they have should have it and they're prepared. Thank you very much. Well okay. done. And I'd also like to say that um, Holland County just recently changed their ordinance. And it's the wording is very similar. Uh, and they're having success with it. Uh, DeKalb, uh, Fulton, and Cobb County also have similar ordinances and programs, and they're successful at this time. Okay. What about some of the, and I appreciate that, you know, sometimes we have sentiments here that when we make reference to the metro counties, um, that there's usually some pushback on that. So what about rural counties that probably have an, a, a little bit more character area to us? Do they have any ordinances that are similar? <coughs> you know, because, and I'll give you an example. I had a little cat, little red, it was a cute little kitten. When I was, and, and this kitten used to attack me. And I would kick away, and it'd come in a little fur ball and just come back and just bite, bite, and just At first it was cute, and it started drawing blood. Like, man, that hurt. Right? Now, this is not how I was older. Just like one day I watched, he was going up the, the, the screen door. And I'm like, whoa. Next day, he's going up the wall to the side of the door. I'm like, okay, that's too much. <laughs> what was that that I had that I got from my? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was the cutest little thing, but it wasn't. It was it was a kid, red, furry, all just. Did you, have, did you have a neuter? <laughs> I just got a cat from somebody that offered us up the head. That was a chainsaw on legs. Yeah. <laughs> All right, and the reason I, and again, you get my example, it's more of a, so, but, but I got it from somewhere in the country, right? Somebody had a litter, whatever the case may be. So I'm asking the rural, and it was an honest question. Um, did you benchmark any rural who has a lot more cats than perhaps urban? I don't know the difference, you know, the density of urban, you know, per capita versus rural, but what about the rural counties? That Carroll have County. Woods? Carroll County has a successful spay neuter program. Okay. Um, they not only return their ferals, they return every cat that comes off the street. Okay. In the premise of that cats usually go back home, but we're. we're about what? The cats go back home. So they'll spay and neuter them and they'll return home and spay and neuter. We don't want to to do an owned cat, we want to do the cats that are neglected, unowned, um, that nobody owns, and that we have no <coughs> avenues for, for getting them out. And we don't eat them as unless they have no chance of a quality of life. But ferals still have a chance of quality of life. If they're vaccinated and spayed and neutered, then they have a caretaker. They'll live out their life successfully with without breeding and get the numbers down. But, yeah, Carroll County is, is as far out as I know of that have a successful program, but they, they've taken their euthanasia rate down, their live release rate is over 90%. I got you. Like, yeah. And I get it, like uh -huh. Floyd and Coweta and all these counties, Carroll and Pauling, and, and I, I, I get it. I mean, I'm thinking about the, the Western region. All right, uh, well done, very well articulated. Appreciate you taking the time. I'm sure the public input um, uh, will be heard and be taken under consideration. Are you back up, Chair? Okay. Uh, Commissioner Mitchell? Yes, just a couple of questions. Have you had a chance to look at the, the change and make sure that, that what we're doing is, you know, no huge conflict or, or... No, I think she's right on. We have. Oh. 
Um, and how, how, how much of the uh, animal control board uh, bought into this or this whole makeup board? Did you kind of consult? They were, they were very um, in favor of it and we have <coughs> spoken about this and looked at it for the past year mm -hmm. um, to make sure that we did this correctly and it would protect both the cats and the citizens of the county and be a whole package that everybody could buy into. Now, now how do we avoid, <clears throat> I mean, it may be a stray cat, but it may be somebody's cat that we don't all of a sudden grab, cut the ear off and say this is a, a unique cat versus somebody's cat. How do we, how do we <clears throat> avoid that type of a situation that we want? Well, the cat would go back out to the community in the That's same area. That's how you've done all you've done. But yeah, it would go home. It happened to be out and about, and you guys happen to catch it for some strange reason. Yeah. And, and it's it's feral. It's not touchable. It's wild, and it's your cat. But I I would think that they would be happy. I mean, we okay. <laughs> well, well, <I'm laughs> we've done these procedures. And, and Bill, maybe you can correct me, <coughs> and correct me, but under lease law, you can't just let your cats roam around the streets. You're not supposed to. So. Yeah. Under our court and order, yeah, you'd be violating the orders by your cat being out to begin with. But how do we legally not get ourselves in any trouble by all of a sudden grabbing somebody's cat who's really a cat lover? Well, that ha just happened to be out and about running. Yeah. Well, I think there's a difference. If, some, if a cat is on somebody's private property, we wouldn't enter to go get the cat and absent some. No, no, they, they set up a trap. All of a sudden, yeah. they capture the cat. Yeah. Well, the cat's outside yeah, their, just, their private running, property. It's over in, in Lisa's yard. Violating, right. they, they violate the law. Right. Yeah. And that works effectively. The traps won't be put on private property. The Understood. traps are put. I got it. Yeah. Yeah. So, but what I'm getting at, though, yeah, you trap it, get it. I understand all that part of it. But in the event that somebody's cat just happened to be roaming around the neighborhood and, and found the, the mouse trap that you guys set for it and happened to get in that trap, but it's, it's really somebody's cat. How do we avoid that? Define owns cat versus feral cat. Uh, owned cat. Well, I mean, you could. Well, the way you get around that is their cat should be identified. It should either have a tag on or a microchip. When we do pick up cats with tags, we pick up more cats with microchips. Microchip goes with the cat, it can't come off. Mm -hmm. um, so their cat should be identified. Citizens also have the option of, as soon as their cat comes up missing, they can go online and file a loss report or they can call us. Here's what I'm alluding to. So you want to just grab the cat, cut his ear, do, his, you know, do the thing and, and, and do them in before you really make sure that this cat is a feral cat. That's all I'm, I'm, I'm alluding to. I mean, I, it, it, I just want to make sure that nobody all of a sudden come back and say to us, hey, you know, that was my cat. Even though he was roaming around the neighborhood, he shouldn't have, didn't have a leash on. And I, these, are, these are citizen-involved cats. A report would be generated upon somebody making a report and saying, hey, we've got What's these the cats so just hanging around. What's the time frame that you go into your, your <coughs> cut ears and all this other stuff that you guys are talking about? Doing? What's the time frame? Like, it's you catch the cat, it goes right into We the want to go as surgery. fast as we can go. Yeah, but, um, but realistically, two to three days from the time to traps to get them in to get them back out. Okay. Back out on the street. And you get why I'm asking the question, because yes. you know, I don't want somebody to all of a sudden come up and say, you, 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 you do well, what, what I think, what I think the commissioner is alluding to, there ought to be some mm -hmm. minimum time before you cut the ear. Yeah. Because if you notice your cat's missing, it may be a few hours, it may be a day. Right. Then you report it in. They wouldn't want y'all trapping the cat, and then that day, a few hours later, cutting the ear and doing all the work. But I think that I think what, what they understand is they can distinguish because they're professionals what is a feral cat versus right. a domestic yeah. cat. I get. Where me and me, I'm not a cat person, so I don't know. Right. Right. And that's why I'm trying to make sure that we avoid that kind of situation. Now, I mean. Because I, I heard three layers of types of feral cats. Yes. So that one layer that now where he or she could be touched could be misjudged. Maybe. And we could always just stick with the three day stray hold. Yeah. I mean, that would solve the problem. But, I, I, you know, the program for the feral cats is designed to be cats that. Yeah. I don't want to pull on the time, but I'm thinking yeah. that you probably should just to, to be safe, because if not, I, I think we're going to have a lot of possible lawsuits or somebody saying, you took my cat, came back with half an ear, and you know, what did they do, blah, 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 blah. I, I don't know. And maybe I'm wrong. It, it may not be that bad, but 
you know. Well, well so far the Supreme Court of Georgia said that animals are personal property and there is no, despite emotional attachment and all that, mm -hmm. li liability for damages. But as to governments with sovereign immunity and ordinance in place, provided that cat is captured illegally pursuant to ordinance, mm -hmm. I don't really see a problem, but I understand what you're saying. So how it, It's just the tip of the ear. It's not like half the ear. Just I'm, the tip. But the tip in the ear, you know, uh, um, <laughs> They, they won't be able to reproduce anymore. You're taking right. the air, you're giving them a right to Yeah, there could be a lot of little things that we've done that, like, oops, that wasn't uh, a feral cat. But I don't, you know, I mean, I, I like what we're trying to do and trying to accomplish that. So we'll make sure that we don't all of a sudden get ourselves in something that we wasn't trying to do. So I don't know if it's 72 hours or two weeks. Mm -hmm. I don't know what that number is. The 72 hour stray hole period is, is a county ordinance. Mm -hmm. It's not a state ordinance, and that's what gives us the ability to rewrite our ordinance and say that on feral cats the 72 hour stray hole would be exempt. So Ken, do we do something to this effect? Do we, do we, if it's a definite feral cat that you can definitely identify that you go and do without the 72 hours? Or do we, do we have the flexibility to kind of make the, the rules as such? Or do we go straight in and oops, we make a mistake and now we've got some, some issues? Well, I think the program she proposes distinguishes between the feral cats and the domestic cats. Mm -hmm. So I think what she's proposed is fine. There will be, on occasion, the, the, the miscellaneous difference between us and the citizen, and maybe what it needs more than anything is some education. Look, I got neighbors who let their dogs walk across the street and go to the bathroom, but I like the leash law yes. because they don't know any better. And maybe there needs to be a little bit of an education program out for our citizens as to, you can't let your cats just wander around you can't let your dogs just wander around. But in the meanwhile, do we go with the immediate results or do we wait or do we what? I think their program works and it's worked in other counties and what they're proposing is reasonable, but I think it's a political decision whether you think there's going to be a delay. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. Um, and, and the caretakers, um, help me to understand the caretakers you were speaking of earlier. That's just a... Uh, Let's say you have a feral cat on your property, or you got two or three, and you live in a neighborhood, and you talk to your neighbors, and you're like, well, I've been feeding this cat. I mean, who's not going to feed a stray that comes up? They're hungry. Mm -hmm. You feed them. Mm -hmm. um, and you talk to your neighbor behind you and beside you down the street. We've been feeding it, too. I mean, cats, they'll go eat five or six houses. Mm -hmm. and eat, eat, eat. Um, so you, you, you bring the animal to the shelter, or you call the shelter, and we... We don't want the animal euthanized, and that's what a lot of people come in. What can we do? And up until now, I've said, well, I don't have any more resources unless somebody wants a barn cat. Well, we filled up all the barns. Um, and I say, you can have the cat back in your community. We'll go ahead and spay and neuter it. We would pursue grant funds and donations to do this uh, to cover the cost. Um, but we're going to spay and neuter it and give it back to you with the understanding that you and others in your communities are caretakers. And okay. Commissioner, I think, I think uh, probably what's missing in the dialogue is this, and I think she alluded to it just then, but maybe we'll clarify for purposes of the public. They're not, when they get a cat, they're checking for a chip and they're che checking for the leash or a collar or whatever. Mm -hmm. But there is some investigation that goes on that's documented as to how they make a determination this doesn't belong to somebody where it's found. In other words, y'all should be documenting that you took Wait. more steps than just the tag and the chip to identify, hey, they see this cat wandering around, I talked to this neighbor, I talked to this. There should be some investigative notes, and as long as we act reasonably, I think then we're all right. I think without the investigation, then you get into the worry that you have. Right. So is that So we do a pathway assessment on every okay. animal that comes in. If if an animal if we could reach in and grab it, um, that would be a semi feral. We're gonna hold back on that animal um, because it could possibly be somebody's pet. Right. We're talking about the, the ones that we can't touch, they're spitting, they're growling. Um, nobody's gonna want them. Um, kittens, we would call them from the community and place them for adoption or any cats that we could handle. Okay. Okay. Um, and um, we do a pathway assessment. The officers leave notices when they pick them up. 
at the houses where they pick them up. Um, yeah. You know, the community is going to be involved, and if we have a community where the residents <coughs> don't want to bring the cats back, then we definitely wouldn't just put them okay. out. We would okay. go with their wishes, and that's what I like about our program. It allows us to write our own policy and procedure, and do pathway assessments. Every animal gets a pathway when it comes into the shelter. It goes for adoption, it goes for medical holding, it goes for known owner, um, it gets to find this feral, uh, needs work. Your pathway to access, I, I like that. Mm -hmm. now, now I'm a little more comfortable with saying, okay, I, I see it. at least we, we're not just grabbing them, cutting them, nipping them, and chipping them. And That's great. Okay. Without a pathway assessment, yeah. the whole works would get gummed up because they would just be sitting in cages and we wouldn't know. Absolutely. We go to each animal and ask that animal, what do you need? Just like you would with a patient in the hospital. Right. There's somebody that goes around, what do you need? Mm -hmm. um, and we go okay. from there. Okay. And last but not least, so when and where the placement of your traps? Do you, is it on call where people call in and say, I see a soft state cat, you would attack me, you would attack a uh, vice chair, and so on? Well, if we have an animal that's attacking somebody, that's a, a different concern. The fair cats, they usually don't attack you. Um, but that, if we have a stray cat, now he got this cat. Right. He, he did I think that was his cat. He did something. <laughs> <laughs> he tormented that cat. So, um, so, so but. But but um, so so you you'll you'll initiate this by call. Yes, yes. The citizen would call us and oh. say they need a trap. We would um, they can come pick up, deliver. Okay. Excuse me. And um, we would initiate the call for the trap. Teach them how to set it. Usually the citizens help us watch the trap. They'll call us and say we got one. Come get it. And. Yeah. We'll go out and get the cat, and then when we bring it in, we give it some cooling off period once we trap them. I mean, some cats walk out of the trap hurry, but some of them walk out and, and they're mad, and within a couple hours they calm down. And that's why the pathway is so important um, because they get vaccinated when they come in the door. Um, and we take, take their temperature, we, we check them, okay. we do a tip to tail inspection so we can get that pathway going. And I guess last but not least, I think you need to get with programming or with Rick and these guys and, and, and let's talk about educating the general public about this and about the process and about kind of the do's and don'ts and how we can kind of be of a great assistance so we can educate them more than anything. So, okay, I yield back. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Commissioner Mitchell. Any other comments from the Board of Commissioners before we move on? Commissioner Carlton. Uh, I had the pleasure of visiting the shelter and seeing what you all do absolutely wonderful. Um, to Commissioner Mitchell's point, I think you and I spoke about getting a program in place where you could educate the public and what funds would be needed for that. Uh -huh. So just remind um, me of what you wanted to do again in order to get those um, fees to educate the public. Quickly. Well, we want to implement a diversion program where instead of writing a citizen a ticket, that we give them an option of coming and taking a class and they would pay a fee for that class. We could use those fees for education um, for our officers and our officers to be able to educate our resource officer to go out in the community and educate. But we find that ticketing residents a lot of times just puts us at odds and they really don't understand how to obey the ordinance because it's, you know, you think, well, I'm gonna keep, you need to keep your dog up. But usually behind it, and we try to go into a little bit of this out in the field, why is your dog getting out, you know? And we can give them tips and guidelines on how to maintain their kids, um, products they can use, no jump harnesses, um, you know, um, radio collars, things of that nature. So I think the diversion program would help us with those fees. Thank you so much. Are you Okay. Thank you so much. Are you all right. Well, thank you so much. Very good presentation. Look forward to tomorrow's public okay. hearing. Thank you. Next, we have our business items. Tab number eight is authorization to create a new full-time juvenile assistant <coughs> DA position. We have our uh, district attorney here, Ryan Leonard, to present on, present on this uh, matter. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Um, this is a follow-up to 
one of our requests that we made in the last uh, budget cycle. At that time, we requested a couple of positions, including a juvenile assistant district attorney position. Um, that position would be paid at $54,338. Then when you take the benefits, uh, total 77342 So we requested that in the last budget cycle. Uh, we didn't get in that cycle. Since then, uh, there's been some developments within my office that have enabled us to help y'all help us. Um, so we're, we're able to, um, with the passing of one of our juvenile assistant DAs named Barry Wood a few weeks ago, uh, he was getting paid at a high rate commensurate with his experience. Uh, so he was getting paid at $100,000 plus $31,000 in benefits. So we started having a conversation because of his high rate of pay, would we be able to turn his position into two positions, thereby making us more efficient in the sense that we would have two hands on deck. And so we started running the numbers. When we ran the numbers, uh, we would be able to fund both salaries, but we can't fund uh, the the um, add-ons, the benefits for the second position. So uh, I'm coming in front of the court, the, uh, excuse me, not the court. <laughs> <laughs> the, county commission, the county commission today to request uh, that y'all meet us partway. Uh, originally, we were asking for $77,000. Um, we're able to come up with uh, fifty. 50 some odd thousand of that and we would need 22,000 for the second position and we would be able to fully fund the first position. So in the creation of the two positions, the total necessary funds would be 154,000 and we're able to come up with 131,927 and that would leave us 22,000. 757.53 short um, out of the 154,000. Uh, as I mentioned in going through the budget process last year, uh, we have been trying to fund this position through other means, not just asking the county. We've tried to go through the state, I believe three years in a row we've applied to the state. Uh, last year, we were tied for the last spot that was gonna get one, we got bumped, and then this year, uh, it was cut completely out of the budget um, down at the state. And so nobody is getting a juvenile ADA through the state this year. So that, that avenue of funding is not there either. And so um, all we can do is try to um, come, out, come back to you all again. Uh, like I said, we're uh, most of the way there. We're almost there in terms of being able to fund this. But it, it's not just something within my office. Obviously, it, it impacts juvenile court, helps juvenile court greatly. Um, I talked more in detail last year about the need for it in juvenile court. And uh, I'm placed in a situation where I have to try to balance resources between superior and juvenile. And it's hard for me to say, well, I'm going to take more resources from serious violent felonies and give them to juvenile court. But this breaking this one position that was a high paid position up into two juvenile should, um, it's not going to detract from superior court and it should enable us to help uh, juvenile court. Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions anybody has. Okay. Any questions from the board commissioners or comments? Commissioner Guido. Yes, uh, Mr. Leonard. Uh, uh, your number of assistant DAs, is it by uh, in accordance with your, the population of the county? How do you get more from the state? Yeah, there's, well, there's, it, it's, it's complicated, but uh, there, there's a set number that is correlated to the number of Superior Court judges. So that technically is correlated to population. Um, I know for a long time, Douglas County was, I think, number third in the state on the list of getting Superior Court judges, and for whatever reason, that has changed, and I, I haven't heard any rumblings recently that we're in line to get another one, but I believe for each Superior Court judge, we automatically get two ADAs, an investigator, and a secretary. 
So that provides some of them. And then the others through the state are just on a year by year basis. If the prosecuting attorney's council wants to ask the legislature for additional funding to supply positions, then the prosecuting attorney's council for the state goes through and looks at need and looks at number of cases. And so that's the analysis they did statewide um, last year and we were actually supposed to get a spot and then at the last minute Cobb County came in and said we submitted our paperwork we're not on the list what happened they realized they had ignored Cobb County so when they put Cobb County into the matrix that bumped us I think we were sixth in terms of they had six spots to give the six most needy districts circuits in the state uh, and so that bumped us from six to seven, and so we didn't give, get one. But technically, under their analysis, in terms of need, we would be the most needy next in line this year. But all the stuff that goes on the legislature, that there wasn't money to fund those positions, new positions this year, and so we missed out. So Have I know that's a long answer, but <clears throat> it is correlated to population in part, but then this specific <clears throat> request is predicated on need. And this was one of your BIRs? Yes, uh, ma'am, it was last year. We had several, and this was one uh, as well. Uh, have you already replaced Mr. Wood? No, ma'am. We, uh, we started, um, we advertised, uh, I believe, middle of last week, we started running ads um, for his position. Um, our plan would be to have two entry-level positions. The 54,000 is starting entry-level, lowest level, and have two of those. And so we're advertising uh, one, and then depending on how this shakes out we would advertise the other if we get it but you're confident you can bring someone on at, at entry level yes ma'am that in in terms of the prosecution hierarchy i guess you know juvenile court is a traditional uh, starting place for young lawyers out of law school i mean a lot of them are happy to get a job and to be in prosecution and they understand hey you know we need to be in juvenile court and then one day if we we like it, we can stay. If not, we can move up the Superior Court. And it's actually gonna be easier to fill than a $100,000 position in juvenile court because a lot of experienced <coughs> lawyers, some would go there, but most experienced prosecutors would wanna go in the Superior Court. So. Okay. I yield back. Okay, thank you so much. <coughs> thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good morning, Mr. Gay. Question for all right. So this is again, this is a replacement position that you needed some extra. So all right, this is probably more internal. Got it. I understood, and, and I, I get the need, and you know, I, I I'm, I've always found it curious over the past ten years. Just well, it, not curious, interesting. Um, the, uh, when I look at the DA and the solicitor, um, and juvenile versus public defender, and I always look at that equilibrium, and it's always a you're outgun. You know, there's an outgunning of two to three, three to four. Uh, as a multiple, um, and uh, again, you stand before judges, and you know the public defenders have to, you know, they got to react, and, and it's it's always interesting. But I understand the state, all right. But my job is also to balance to make sure there's appropriation for both sides, and that everybody has their, you know, their uh, rights um, honored. That being said, all right. Um, to do this, uh, Director Holland, where are we proposing we pull this from? I mean, I get what he has in play. How do we make up the difference? It would be, um, what I would suggest, would be from the contingency. Okay. All right. Now, with the contingency, now, you can burn through that pretty fast. It's, 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 as chairman of finance, this is just us talking amongst my peers. You're going to burn through that pretty fast, guys, at this rate. Um, when does um, our, ten, I mean, you know where I'm going. Where, when does that kick in? And can, Give me the timeline for the 10 that perhaps gives us some room. Well, the, the tax anticipation note would be just the cash flow. So this would be not as much of an impact to that tax anticipation note, but we would are looking at um, opening the bids on the 12th, which is next Friday, uh -huh. um, and then um, coming up with a recommendation the following Monday at a work session and awarding that on the 16th. Okay, but if you take it out of contingency, and again, we don't really have any formal rules out of contingency. We just sort of 
do it, right? It, it's just that we make up rules as we go and how we choose to use the money is fine, and I'm not challenging that. Uh, but what, what I am pushing on, though, is more deliberate. This is, okay, are you going to replace the contingency? <coughs> I, mean, I mean, is this the best use based on priorities, right? Um, one more time, what's the difference that we're talking about, uh, Madam Director? $22,857. All right, so mm -hmm. to, to my peers, it means should we have a rule that says we should replace when we take out when it wasn't tied to a priority? We didn't anticipate this. There was other things on our list of things that came through. Our prior budget that was in the BIRs that we had as a priority, we know that was cut out by the administration. So what think it be? Um, I won't belabor this. I'm, I'm not necessarily uh, opposed to the request. Uh, it's just how we go about funding um, in, in light of where we are right now. And so I'm going to yield for now. Okay. Just for my call. Okay, thank you so much, Vice uh, Commissioner Mitchell. So if I'm hearing you correctly, there's about 22 thousand dollars that we're trying to make up the difference of because other than that your budget will take up the, the majority of it correct that's correct the 131 um, out of 154 will be covered by Barry's position including his salary and his benefits okay. um, just create being created though could we have actually did one and a half to kind of make it work at your full-time and a part-timer to kind of, I don't know, and, and, and again, I don't know kind of the operation at the VA level would something like that work. And I'm just trying to be creative to try to say <coughs> how can you just whatever in your budget to absorb your budget from that perspective versus taking it elsewhere and, and, and pulling it from someplace else. Just Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I think we have in the past had part-time secretaries and things of that nature but as far as an attorney i don't know that that's feasible um, right. you know it's uh for a number of reasons and you know normally when you're under you're in the ada under the district attorney's office you have to sign take oaths that you can't practice in any other way you can't take money from any other source and so if we had a part-time prosecutor job somebody would have to subsist on right. something substantially less than 54,000 and so that's that's the entry level and uh, so it is something that um, you know in the current year um, we apparently are running well with our budget if we had to make up the difference this year um, we probably could find that in other areas that we haven't spent but that's not something moving forward year to year and so um, you know, in the short term, we probably, if we were granted this position, could cover the the shortfall. Um, but as far as an ongoing year by year, um, that's not something that I can promise. But in talking to my office manager, apparently we have, um, for certain reasons, certain positions have been empty, and therefore that money is going unspent, etc. We have money in the budget this year probably to make up that shortfall got it so but but we got to look at this long term yeah so i agree I'm, I'm just, just you yeah. know but i appreciate that the, the, the thought though but jennifer you said something you want to add something or something like this yeah. yeah um and it would just be for you know this year obviously not looking long term but because those are the salaries if you were being filled for the entire year well you still you got a vacancy right now right yeah. So you're going to have some of that funding available to make up for some of this right. because okay. of yeah, and it yeah. should take several months to fill them. So right. right. So, but will you eventually go? I'm, I'm sorry, you didn't. Uh, yes. will, will you eventually go back and once you fill the one big position that that you once upon a time had, or yeah, I mean, I guess if <laughs> if so. I'm if I'm not if I'm not given these two separate ones, then yeah, I would want to. So if you're given these two, then you won't go back to try to fill the other. Yeah, I, well, I wouldn't want to fill one at 100 and then one at 50. I would want to fill two at 54. No, that's what we get. Okay, so the two positions that you're speaking of now, if this was granted, yeah. let's say we, we, you got the blessings of, the, of the, the commission, will you go back and try to somewhere down the road or need to fill the, the, the position of the gentleman who passed? 
Uh, I get it's technically it's one of these is his. Mm. One of these two is his. It's so just, there will be no needs of that. I'm just moving <laughs> money. Yeah, I'm moving the money you. from that I, into trying to create a new. Yeah. I understand. So, so you're. But I'm not going to come back next year if I have these two and say now I want a hundred on this fifty-four. If that's what you're asking. That's exactly right. That's what I was alluding to. So I just want to make sure that that's not kind of where we're going. So your organizational chart will change, which will if this passed. Yeah, I mean, and technically it's it's more in line with the prosecution community. And again, Barry was unique because he had been, you know, contract public defender or prosecutor for 20, 30 years. And so his experience warranted that salary, but I can't really anticipate a scenario where you would hire somebody in mm -hmm. that would require a hundred thousand dollars in juvenile court so it is you know it's actually more in line with common practice in the prosecution community to have the the juvenile positions be lower paying than um you know than it was got it. okay okay um good and these will be contracted employees if i'm hearing you correctly uh these two or would they be just okay. regular salaried employees yeah there are Jeffrey, you know, on his Barry was Barry was contracting. Right? Right. Right. He used was. to be. I think. I don't think he is now. Yeah, I think he fell under there. Under he the came Brooklyn under the board. DA's office like six, seven years ago. Before that, he was contract. So there would be positions on his schedule. What you have unique in the DA's office, you have state funded positions, and you have county funded positions, and some supplemented that are state. Bear, the DA, uh, excuse me, all the prosecutors in the juvenile court or county funded mm -hmm. positions would be normal unless he changes how he does right. things. And so they would be county <coughs> positions. I don't think under contract. Got it. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I think it, I think initially the confusion is, and I think the district attorney mentioned this. Barry was the first time that someone on that that was a contract outside entity did the prosecution for years. They wanted to bring it in-house for training, for support staff, for the thing because the juvenile court was growing so mm -hmm. tremendously. And then I think he went off contract and just became a county employee in that okay. position. Okay, okay. Is that right? That's right. right. Okay, last comment. So with the grant funds that we're hopefully making those still requests, I know we fell yeah. short by a, a county, I guess it is. Will we continue to make those requests? And if by chance those requests are, you know, granted, will that offset these costs or will you look at something else? Um, <laughs> I mean, we we obviously are still going to make those requests. Um, I hadn't gotten so far as, well, if I happen to get it, because you know how things work in Atlanta. I mean, mm -hmm. I was told last year that we'll get it next year. And right. now it's next year and I'm not getting it from right. Atlanta. So I honestly don't want to really make a lot of plans based on what may happen down there but we will keep applying for it right, i can right. promise you that keep applying so in the event that we do happen to fall in the right slot yeah this year next year year after that next that we'll we'll apply it toward these two positions is my question though um yeah i mean well oh you want to give that some thought yeah, I, I guess I, I haven't really thought about how that would fit into the matrix. Obviously, um, I wouldn't then, if I got a new position from the state, let's right. say next year or two years, whenever, uh -huh. I wouldn't then come to you and say, I have this new position from the state, I want another position from y'all also. I mean, I, if, that, if that answers your question, that would so defray, right. that would defray us needing to come back to you all in the the near foreseeable future and ask for another position and we could use we probably could use that money um, or move other money to create other positions because i in the last vr i asked for i think two or three different positions so we could potentially use that money or move other money to create i think we asked for uh, another investigator and maybe a secretary. So I think we could move the money around in that respect. So it would, in the overall scheme of things, help <coughs> alleviate the burden on the county, um, you know, as far as that's concerned. Now, how it would work to then come in and say, we 
don't want this funding from the county that the county was already giving us, I can't really. And, and what I was going to get to is, 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 is I know we're trying to shift and kind of make this particular two positions from one to two work for you. And you still applying for the possible monies through the state and wherever that dollars and cents may come from. In the event that it does, um, and even though it's, it, we're only short by $22,000, give or take, you know, if that happens, you get the grant, would the money be applied here, or do you have other visions <coughs> saying, well, I still need, from what you just said, you got several other BIRs that you needed, so you probably will need that funding to be shifted there, and this will stay as is, if I'm hearing you correctly. <coughs> However, in my head, I'm trying to just kind of take the, the small nickels and dimes that we got to try to make sure we kind of fund what you need, what your needs are, to ensure we get you where you need to be. I mean, this is our most pressing need, you know, okay. and, and in the last budget cycle, I, I think I conceded that to the county. I was asking okay. for multiple things, but mm -hmm. I said, if I can only have one thing, it would be this. And so the funding of this, um, would be my priority and then any extra money my answer would be yes it it would go to cover anything else and we would outside of this yeah, outside of these two yeah. positions okay. and we then would need to come to you all and say hey we need secretary we because for fifty four thousand, we should be able to get um probably a couple of support staff I, I know our investigators start right around 50 um but i think uh, we could get a secretary and, and probably um, maybe two secretaries by moving a little bit of money, which would be, um, would, would help us. Okay, okay. okay. well, I, I was just trying to cuddle up as much as we can in one, in one area versus looking at where it might could be with your reorganization or charts that would, that would actually have these two positions <coughs> underneath that in that position versus the state give you the dollars, where would that money go? Go rather. Um, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I, I get the whole makeup, but I'm just, you know, just trying to figure out the other parts of the dollars and if you get the state dollars. So I yield back. Okay, thank you so much, Commissioner Mitchell. Commissioner Dyer? <clears throat> yes, uh, I'm sure that you're asking for this because of your workload, the increase in your workload. We read a lot about it in, in the paper and stuff like that. And with all the drug problems and everything, it affects the youth um, a lot more. Uh, if you delayed the hiring of one of these positions, you would probably make up the difference in the saving, I mean, the, the excess. So if you went ahead and advertised for one, you could probably fill that and wait about mid-year and fill the second one, and then you wouldn't need any extra money. <laughs> Uh, just a su suggestion. Yeah, it, I guess then the, the concern is if I hire somebody in the second position mid-year, are they going to have a job in the following year? You know, so I'm happy to try to, you know what I'm saying? Like, if, is, is that going to be in the budget moving forward? Because well, I would what, be... Once the position is approved, then right. it's approved from here on out. Okay, yeah. Right. So well, then, I'm, I'm happy to... I'm but happy I, that was just a suggestion way, yeah. of if we're worried about the 22,000, uh, but I'm, I know that your workload, just like everybody else, you know, that comes before us, uh, their workload has increased as the population goes up. So we need to give everybody, uh, especially our elected officials, uh, respect. Yeah, and I'm, I'm happy to make accommodations, like you said, in this year, this budget year, in terms of um, the shortfall. Um, I, we can we can suck it up in the short term. You know, um, those of you that know Barry know that he you know he had throat cancer, so he had trouble speaking, and so we've been dealing with that for a couple of years, trying to accommodate. And I've actually pulled lawyers from Superior Court to put in the juvenile to help um, two of them over the past several years and that's what we have in there right now is two superior court prosecutors in juvenile so technically right now i don't have any juvenile prosecutors uh, in there um, and so that's kind of what i'm trying to accomplish is get two positions in there be able to move 
people back in the superior so then superior is not short staffed and so it's I, I understand and you need to know uh, <coughs> in your budget what you can uh, account for uh, yes, and uh, how you can uh, in the, in distribute the, need, the cases and everything you've got to know ahead of time so I in the need that I that you reference you know not referenced it earlier is actually calculated on the state level you know looking at all districts and that we were you know one of the most needy yes. in terms yes. of an, an additional a new not just you know the same ones and a new one and so i'm just trying to accomplish that same thing and i commend you on your uh, the way you're handling this too so i yield back okay thank you so much <coughs> da i appreciate your cre creativity with, with managing your area and i really respect managers that look around in your budgets to determine what you can do to make up the shortfalls and however it sounds like this twenty two thousand dollars we need to budget next year to make sure that it's there so we can bolster this budget and it sounds like you're going to work with us to try to That's correct. move it down. But also, I just want to make sure, Board of Commissioners, are we going to leave this? I need to make sure if I'm going to leave this under, uh, for business item our authorization to create a new full-time juvenile assistant DA position because that's what you need to do. You need to create one. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't have a cost attached to it. So this will be on there. So I just want to make sure when we vote, we vote accordingly. Uh, vice, I mean, um, Commissioner Mitchell. Yes, yeah, and you're right for clarity. So. But, but it appears that like we're saying create two new positions or no, just one. No, they're replacing one. Oh, to approve. Oh, I'm sorry. To create, create another new. one. Okay. What well, I'm reading. I'm just put this on the reading. Mm -hmm. Authorize authorization to create a new full time new analysis. You know, but I think if I'm hearing correctly, he wants no new one. Just one new one. One new one. The other one is second place position and making one position to, to, to two. So he still has the one vacant, and now he's just needing another position. Okay. And he's going to change the salary component. So, so we, we'll look forward for this tomorrow. Too. It will remain on our uh, agenda. Okay. But I just want you all to realize what you're voting on. Right. We're just voting on to add a new position. Right now the DA is going to work with us to help compress some of that cost and then next year we need to budget that twenty two thousand dollars to offset. Did I say it right in the reader's digest version? Is that is that okay? Yes, well, yes, well, okay. Thank right. you so much. And if y'all, you know, if we'll talk so when we know when we can fill it if it passes, you know, and all that. We'll okay. This being yeah, yeah, yeah. <coughs> thank, right, thank you. All right. Tab number nine, authorization to approve an easement agreement with HAB Group LLC and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents subject to final legal review. Attorney Fowler. Good evening, everyone. Well, good morning, I should morning. say. This is an uh, income generator. Actually, it's the sale of an easement to the developer of what was formerly the Shawnee's, then Kenny's property. The building burned down. There's going to be a restaurant constructed there they need access through staff level negotiations it's been determined that the an easement accessing Earl D. Lee Boulevard can connect that old restaurant site to what would be the new site in Earl Lee Boulevard. I've worked with the staff, been through two or three levels of iterations of the document that's on for the agenda tomorrow. There's compensation that's set forth in the document to be paid to the county. We've considered all the changes that the county yeah. staff has recommended. Madam Chair, we've, yes. we've worked with uh, Mark and, and Joe. It's $60,000, uh, mm -hmm. and it's a non-exclusive easement, meaning it's not it's not giving away our rights with respect to access, but granting them additional access. More as it's, more, it's a traffic management thing, because to come out of this site and have it redeveloped, they need to get on their early mm -hmm. little more so they can get that light as opposed to trying to Cross Fairburn Road coming straight out. Okay. No, because they don't make a right out of here. But well, they can make a right, but they can't make a left. Right, so then they're right. going to easement to Earl Lee and then mm -hmm. make a left like light. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. Mm -hmm. Who is HAB? I'm sorry. I don't know. Joe, who's HAB? Like it's Richard Culpepper. It's an entity owned by him and his son. And what kind of restaurant? I'm not sure that I'm allowed to say it oh, at okay. this point. Okay. But you'll probably go there. I'm just curious. <laughs> if you're interested in a quick meal. Uh, there, there are provisions in the easement that the county's requested to re-landscape as necessary to the degree that it would be destroyed. Right. Okay. Any questions from the board? 
comments, there's, Commissioner Mitchell? There's one, so we are clear about kind of what we had asked and the conditions and stuff that we wanted with this easement mm -hmm. that Joe yeah. Yeah. Mark, and, yeah, they're all in, and, and Mark negotiated yeah. the terms okay. directly. Mm -hmm. uh, we've just reviewed it and made a couple changes, and Joe's agreed to our changes. Okay. Would you like fries with this easement agreement? <laughs> <laughs> I'm giving up carbs right now. I'm sorry. I yield back. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner. <laughs> Okay. Well, thank you so much, Attorney. Hey. We need to have a representative tomorrow. I'll be in the court during this time frame. Would this be on a consent agenda, or do we need a representative present? It's going to be a, on a business item, but uh, <coughs> is, it, is, is there one? Be voted separate. Yeah, was, what, just so y'all know, if y'all are looking at the document, that is one of the earlier drafts that I have the actual final one that'll go. And it is, Joe confirmed is 60000 in yeah. consideration. Mm -hmm. okay. Do we need to have a representative tomorrow? That's what he said, a representative tomorrow. He's I, I don't think so. I can, I can do it. All right. We have with right. with Joe Jefferson. Yeah, that'll yes. be fine. Thank you very much. Okay, sounds good. Thank you so much, Attorney Fowler. Next, uh, tab number 10, authorization to amend the GEB, a uh, GEP for a defined, uh, defined benefit plan agreement for Douglas County mm -hmm. employees to provide for a five-year vesting provision applicable to grant-funded uh, contract uh, employees and authorized the chairman to sign all related documents. Director Perry. Yes, man, uh, essentially, uh, Madam Chair, uh, this would move uh, contract uh, grant funded contract employees into the same category as uh, regular staff employees uh, that have to meet the five year vested period. Uh, I have to speak with Mark who brought to my attention that we kind of want to make a change there. So uh, that is what uh, this will focus on. That I've included a resolution as well as uh, an adoption agreement amendment from GEPCOR that will affect this change. Now, this will be effective April 2nd. Uh, should you all approve it, it will be effective April 2nd moving forward. Uh, so all employees that uh, are hired after this state that fall in that category will have a five-year vesting period. Okay. Contract related. Okay. Any questions for the board, Vice Chairman? Yeah. No comment. Thank you, Madam Chair. I want to be um, make sure I hear this right because I had interest in this one. So um, is there anybody who vests prior to five years? Yes. Okay, and, and what are those categories and classifications for the record? Um, they are considered outside employees, uh, Commissioner, and uh, pretty much they are all contract employees that are hired by the county. They uh, vest in the, plan, in the plan on the date that they start employment. Who is rich? Woo! I can say, this mm -hmm. is, well, is going to reverse It's okay. So that, it, I, it, I, it sounds good, record. but it's not necessarily rich. Yeah, the actual takeout. Right. <laughs> yeah, but it, it's all relative, right? Mm -hmm. um, it, it's just about seasoning, about vesting, like your, your commitment, right? And, and you, we, and this is historical. This is that latent past where we, you dealt certain privileges based on certain considerations. And I, I recognize that this is a cleanup moment. Mm -hmm. I just had to state it for the record. Like, okay. oh wow, you just people got doped in just on day one. But best thing, which is not a traditional type of thing, and so I, Absolutely. I wanted to highlight that. But I appreciate you bringing that forward, and we can clean up some of this this history that was inconsistent. So I'm going to yield. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yeah. Uh, for for Commissioner Meister, and, and I asked this, and for Fred, for the way the resolution reads, we're really reclassifying grant funded contract employees not all contract employees. So yes. I want to make sure that's that, clear with that you all understand. It's grant. It's grant only. So mm -hmm. it's a grant backed uh, employment position and they're pursuant to a contract. When the grant ends, they end and this affects their vesting rights. Mm -hmm. It does not f affect, to Commissioner Robinson's point, regular contract employees that aren't grant funded. Is that right? That right. is correct. Okay. So, so to that point, is there individuals outside of grant funding that is on day one getting automatic vesting? Yes, sir. Contract employees are so vested. Basically, directors. I'm just yes. making them, I don't really know. Yes. Just for the sake of the conversation to clarify that there's on well, day one. Let's get automatic vesting. What do commissioners get? 
five year best? Yeah, no. Mm -hmm. uh, elected officials would be uh, automatically best as well. Uh, the one the commissioners automatic, not five yes. year? Yes. No. And, and mayor, describe when a merit system yeah. employee is vested, because I, I think they need to hear that yes, to understand Thank the contract you. employees. A, a merit system employee is vested after five years of service, mm -hmm. continuous service. Okay, so the merit, see there's some separation, there are some classes. Yes. That's all I, I wanted to make sure that we're hitting it, and we're saying it He's publicly right. so that the, the public can distinguish, because again, people come in and they like, well, wait a minute, how did that person get this and I have that? And it's not about the money, it's just the intent that privileges are automatic or just vesting. And that's all I want to put. Thank you, Tim. Okay. You, you, you help with that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, you finished? Uh, question? I'm fine. Oh, okay. I'm going to let you go back. Um, yes, I have a question for further clarification. Mm -hmm. A grant from the employee would not be vested if his grant ran out before five years. Is that, is that what this is doing? Current. <coughs> that's that's correct. This this would require a grant funded contract employee to have a vesting period of five years. For so the, for for purposes of people hired April second, two thousand nineteen and beyond. If you were a grant funded contract employee before April second, two thousand nineteen, you would not be affected by the five year period. Correct. That is correct. But if you if you we had a grant. And we hired this em employee, mm -hmm. and the grant was only for two two years. They, they would have been if they got hired by contract approved by the board prior to April second, two thousand nineteen. They would have invested on day one. Their payout would be minuscule for yeah, two years of work, but they would have been invested in the retirement benefit program. Correct. I did not know that. I thought everybody had to work through five years before they would. Have been. Yeah, and, and to put context on this. When these started coming up, the board expressed some concerns about whether we should let an automatic vest occur. And Fred and I got together and we saw that the your plan that was in place historically did not, you would be violating your plan to change the terms of their contract. So this is needed so that when legal and, and Fred negotiate contracts with people who are grant funded contract employees, we needed this provision to be able to change their contract terms for new hires. So the new right. hires will not be new hires unless will not be. they work here five years. That's correct. That's correct. Okay. That's, right. yeah, that's what we do. That's what we do. All right. Okay. Thank you. I yield back. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much, Director uh -huh. Perry. Madam Chair, sure one clarity, please. Okay. One, one, I want to make sure we know we both know. So again, for this for, for did this come by way of recommendation or just this more of an administrative? approach. We're talking about the pension, we're talking about rights. Did this come from the, uh, I don't know, pension board, if you got one? Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I, I'm only from the committees, <coughs> but I'm just curious. How did we get here? Is this a more of an administrative? And I'm okay either way. I just want to know what it is. And I, it is more administrative. Uh, Commissioner, it's not a recommendation from the pension board. And, and uh, Mr. Vice Chair, I can clarify a little bit. When I was on vacation, there was an issue that came up about grant funded employees, Mark contacted me and I told him we cannot, while well, we could alter the contract, we need to first read the pension plan to make sure we weren't violating the terms of our own plan. He then reached out to Fred and Fred got with GEPCOR and determined that we did have a provision in there that vests them on day one and that we needed to change that investment period before we started changing contracts going forward. So I think that's how it got to y'all today. Is there a policy change or is it just what do we just clarify? Well, you, you, uh, uh, GEPCOR is a defined benefit plan, and when you have a defined benefit plan, uh, the only way it can be changed unless the law changes is for the, uh, the employer to pass a resolution changing provisions in the plan. So essentially what y'all are doing is you're passing a resolution to redefine a certain category in the plan so that you get the effect than what we've just described. So a plan is not a policy. It's a, you know where I'm going. I want to make sure yeah, well, we're clear uh, that we're, we're changing a financial situation, right? It, right. It, it's financial. And I want to clarify, is the resolution alone 
I'm okay. I just wanted to hear you say it that it's that we we're doing this the right way, which is it's a policy that we're changing that has a financial orientation, right? Uh, and that a public we're going to have a public meeting and we're going to change this by way of a simple resolution at the local level. Is that correct? A simple resolution. Are you asking me? Yes. Yeah, this is a simple yeah, resolution. Yeah. Uh, if you were changing the merit system, the policy, uh, the, the way you change the merit system is slightly different. But this is just a resolution. You completely control this defined benefit plan. Uh, while you couldn't breach, you know, under federal and state law, you couldn't breach contractual promises to, to employers before this implementation. This is a going forward plan. So it's not discriminative, discriminatory. It's only, it's not a retroactive application of what you've already committed to to employees that have been hired before April 2nd. Right. Go for now. I just want to bring that out. And, and I, I think, and I may be completely wrong about this, but I don't think our plan is actually an ordinance. It's a contract with GevCorp That's right. pursuant to federal and state law, and you are by resolution authorizing GEPCOR to make pinstroke changes to that plan in the definitions. Can you confirm that for us by tomorrow? I don't, I don't believe it is now. I'm sure you want with the agenda, but can you just confirm what you just said? Uh, can we, we, can, we can do that. Thank you. Yes. <coughs> you want something from GEPCOR confirming that's uh, the way it can be changed? Correct. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I just you got that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay. We're going to move on, but uh, thank you as the chairman of the pension plan. Uh, just if you just get us something in writing, but uh, I'm the one that pushed it. Mm -hmm. So because the you come in, they want vested with the five-year five plan. It is definitely putting a lot of pressure on our pension plan for those one-day contracted folks that's coming in going, wow, we never heard of that. And I know you have a commissioner that and my other commissioner have not either. <laughs> so we're concerned. All right, we'll move on to the next item. Um, number 11, tab number 11, authorization to create a new juvenile program uh, position for juvenile justice incentive grant program manager to be funded by the juvenile justice incentive grant criminal justice coordinating and council grant. And that's tabled, but we will look at for tomorrow if things go as planned to untable this. Hi, hello, Jennifer. Hi. <laughs> yes, ma'am, it's just been tabled. Um, <coughs> we just discussed. It's tied to number 12. Yes, tied to number 12, too. Authorization to approve a uh, contract for Christine Callahan for the project manager for the uh, Juvenile Justice Incentive Grant Programs and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. And this is hinging on tab number 10. Right. So, hey, Madam Chair, one thing that Commissioner Carthen pointed out, and she's correct, if item 10 is changed and item 11 is approved and y'all go to move on item 12 the first draft that's in there is your traditional contract employee for a grant funded we would need to uh, change paragraph h so that it complies with the new policy if paragraph 10 is changed so your approval of 10 11 and consideration of 12 tomorrow will know that there will be a legal change to paragraph H in that contract. Mm -hmm. And it may be a couple other places, but it's related to the vesting period. Okay. Sounds good. Any questions for Ms. Katie? Okay, we have tab number 13, which I believe is totally different. It's authorization to apply for juvenile justice incentive grant fiscal year 20 from Criminal Justice Coordinating Council in the approximate amount of $210 with no match and required an authorized chairman to sign all related documents. Yes, ma'am. Just tell us a little bit about this. Right? The actual amount um, is going to be $249,748.93. Okay. You make a correction. I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Yes. yes. $249,748.93. And it still requires no match? Correct, no match. Um, this is year seven that we've been receiving this grant funding um, programs for our at risk group. Okay. Any questions from the board commissioners? So, uh, good. Sounds good. Appreciate you chasing those grants. Appreciate it. <coughs> Got one more. <laughs> you have one more. There you are. 
authorization to apply for supplemental uh, furniture and technology grant from Criminal Justice Coordinating Council Accountability Court mm -hmm. programs in the approximate amount of $6,000 with no match requiring an authorized chairman to sign all related documents. Mrs. Yes, this is um, through our state money for drug court, and we got one of these last year to fund some technology. We all got little tablets that, that you guys are using, and this year it's furniture and technology, so we'll be looking at, I think, a couple of desks that are needed and some other fun things. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. Any questions? Yeah. Yeah, and, and again, just for accountability court, you're talking about this. So, and again, as we think about superior court, um, juvenile court, these are literal courts. Do we anticipate some point this accountability courts becoming courts? I know right now they're currently being up between Judge Adams and Judge McLean. But when I'm hearing furniture and stuff, and I'm hearing technology, this is behind the scenes. This is administration. This is operations. So. Do you see that keep, it, will there ever be a need for the board of commissioners to fund the formal operations of an accountability court, which is one thing I'm always trying to anticipate. Um, well, I'm speaking for family drug court, I'm which is another branch. Uh, all right, um, that's fine. You know, need, I, I think that we're always gonna have access to, to grant funding, state funding. Um, I think that the growth um, of course, it would be you know a wonderful situation in the future to be to be fully funded by the county. Um, we've we've been very um, blessed with what we we have received. We do have um, a case manager that's county funded. I serve as part of my job as coordinator. We have two peer support people. Um, we also received a federal grant where we're going to hire two more people to expand our capacity. They will be um, totally grant funded as as we've been talking about the other position. Um, so we're going to continue to, to find anything and everything we can to fund and serve these people. It's just, it's just for my peers, just anticipating, and I appreciate you getting these sources, but typically with grants comes an expectation of the future. Um, and the question we have to ask ourselves is at what point do we just allow it to ride on the grants or do we make um, a, a, a formal reconsideration of, of the future? And so we're asking this question right. And so some of it is rhetorical amongst my peers, but some of it just to see what your mindset was. So I, I think I got what I need from her. Thank you, Mr. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Thank you. Anybody? Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right. Next, we'll move to tab number 15, authorization to allow the Metro Atlanta uh, firefighters conference to utilize the area to fire and EMS training facility <coughs> for its annual conference schedule for May 15th through 18th, 2019, and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents to um, Chief Spencer. Yes, ma'am. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, this is a, a Metro Atlanta firefighters conference that's been going on for, I think this is the 10th year that they've done it. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been participating for about eight years ourselves. And uh, this basically allows uh, Metropolitan Fire Department uh, from around the area and actually from across the nation to come here and use our facility for these days in uh, May. And what we get out of the deal is we're able to send folks to other places <coughs> within the Metro Atlanta to get additional training. Mm -hmm. So it's at a no cost for everybody. At no cost? At some cost, okay. but, but at a reduced cost. Okay. Yeah. Any questions from the board? Come in. Good job. Keep going. Thank you. Appreciate you. Thank you. Tab number 16, authorization to enter into a planned service agreement with Johnson Controls for the Boundary Waters Aquatic Center for the period of May 1st, 2019 through uh, April 30th, 2020 at a cost of $5,965.44 and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Director du uh, Dukes. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, yes, ma'am. This is our regular preventive maintenance contract that we uh, do every year with the uh, aquatic center. They come out four times a year and check the system out, change belts, filters, uh, and they're also on call. So uh, just our yearly maintenance agreement. Okay. Any questions for the board? Sounds good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, tab number 17, authorization to apply for an emergency supplemental sub-grant award, accountability court grant from Criminal Justice Coordinating Council in the approximate amount of $54,878 with no match required 
There you go. Hey, Jim. Good morning. Good morning. Mr. Pruitt, Mr. Pruitt, how are you doing? That was wonderful. I've answered to much worse. I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, this, there, just point of clarification, we're actually asking to accept this award amount. We have been approved for this amount already. This was actually a continuation of our original CJCC grant for this year. Uh, we had asked for more money than we originally got. Uh, we're always happy with what we get. We never complain. But when they come back and say, oh, there was some money left over, we raised our hand and said, well, we sure like to get what we asked for the first time. And they said, sure, you can have actual number $54,878. So that has been approved for Douglas County. We just And we would need to amend the budget to accept that money in to the accountability courts. Uh, there is no match. Uh, this will just go to support our ongoing operations. Okay, any questions from the yes. board of commissioners or vice chairman Watson? Mr. Pruitt, I know you've got a better position to answer my previous question. About I knew that was coming. Yeah, you knew I, I, I just saw you. So can, if, if you just take a minute and just, again, just without committal, but just giving a framework, we have new commissioner and so forth. Talk about the accountability court. And again, you're getting this funding, this using for operations um, growth. Anticipation. <coughs> Absolutely, I can yeah. do that, and it is a pleasure to see you. This is our first time seeing each other. Uh, I will try to be brief. That is my Achilles' heels. I like to talk too much. But, um, in general, I think that our ability to continue to ask for grants is strong. I think it is also very strong that the grants will continue to be available. The reason for that is we are diverting inmates from the state prison population. The criminal justice reform that came out four or five years ago has really uh, powered up the accountability court process. So we are, from a purely financial standpoint, saving the state of Georgia millions of dollars mm -hmm. for the accountability courts across the state. Uh, we can articulate here locally that there is there could be support for that as well. I would say that the wonderful thing about the way the grants are set up now <coughs> We can show by saving the state money what we can do. We are proving a theory, and that is happening every day in our court. Uh, we're also not only diverting costs from incarceration from the county jail and from the prison population, but we're also creating revenue. We're creating revenue not from participant fees, which is a very small number, but from the jobs that our people are going out and getting, the education that they are getting to provide themselves with new jobs, as they're buying cars and paying out the loan tax and renting properties and consuming food. So all of these secondary things, they are now not a cost drain. They're a plus on the revenue side. Um, there's a report that I'll share with the Board of Commissioners by email later today that talks about the financial impact of the accountability courts because the Council of Accountability Court Judges is tuned into that exact question. Uh, they want to ensure that funding continues to come from the legislature and they are showing the cost benefits to every county for the accountability courts. Obviously, I am passionate about the accountability courts. I love the work that we do. But there is a strong support at the state level for the accountability courts and for the grants to keep going. I would say the next four years we are set for that for the current administration. I would say that we could articulate that for every administration hereafter. The pendulum of criminal justice typically swings over decades between incarceration and treatment. We can look back over the last hundred years almost and see this pattern. Uh, one day that pendulum will swing back. Right now we're swinging towards treatment mm -hmm. and we are using those funds wisely. We are documenting what we're doing. We are proving our work so it's not a theory anymore because we're showing this is what can happen with a person. As the pendulum starts to swing back a decade from now, that's when the questions will come. Let me, let me I appreciate that. You, you, I, you run for office. That was pretty good. Thank you. Um, the reason I asked that was that, all right, you're using the funds for treatment, which is equivalent of services. There's also um, hard assets that need to be done. One of the fundamental things that, that, that will cost today and tomorrow is housing. And, and, and while we're doing some creative approaches to <coughs> housing, 
our current approach is not scalable, right? At some point, I'm looking at it becomes institutional, right? Mm -hmm. And what is the requirement for the Board of Commissioners to get behind something if we choose? If we allow our long-term capital planning process, one thing that we got uh, encouraged by Moody's is that, okay, you guys made one-off decisions, okay, but you can do better. Right? So my charge is like, as I anticipate what, when I see policy shifts, right? Um, a shift from incarceration, mortgage treatment, and so forth. So with that shift comes a huh, long-term capital plan, setting aside money so that in <clears throat> fact y'all come to us and say, we need to scale beyond this current village to a more, uh, we need housing. We to, to really make this work in housing is expensive, and how will we approach that? And so I'm trying to get a feel for it, um, that part right there, housing. And, um, and again, this is more educational. No, don't take too long. Get, take a couple minutes to respond, and, and then we can keep this going. I will, I will try to be brief. I view one of my primary responsibilities is to continue to bring options to the Board of Commissioners to say these are the options that we have today, and this is what our long-term plan should be. Uh, and if whatever vision the Board of Commissioners ends up adopting uh, will be up to you, obviously. Uh, it is important on timing that we're talking about housing today. The accountability court judges have uh, coordinated training specifically around housing because Douglas County is not alone. Every <coughs> accountability court is facing transportation issues and housing issues. Mm -hmm. Because now that we're not housing people in the county jail, well, well, where are we housing them? And some of those people truly have no place to go. Uh, and how we talk about housing is important. Are we talking about emergency shelter, where we're talking for a number of hours up to a number of days, uh, something less than a week? Are we talking about temporary housing, where it's a week to a few months, or permanent supportive housing for something to go much further along? The permanent supportive housing is, I think, what you're most concerned about. Right. Tomorrow, I'm attending a training session with HUD on their 811 program mm -hmm. for supportive housing, where I have no idea how this will implement in Douglas County. But we're always trying to assimilate those resources and bring them here so that we can go to the development authority and say, was there a program that we're entitled to <coughs> permanent supportive housing? Let's let's capitalize on that. Absolutely. Where we go to HUD and we say, okay, your 811 program, how does that look for Douglas County? And honestly, we can't do that alone. We have to reach out to our counterparts in the, in the community and in the county and say, please help us get this done. That's how we've cobbled together these small solutions right now, but that's also how we'll also work towards permanent long-term solutions. I, I appreciate that, and again, I appreciate that sometimes when we talk about um, incentives, um, um, we talk about jobs, and sometimes we question whether or not we get a, a, an appropriate trade-off. Uh, I believe this was a consideration that should be given to charity, such as with you, or, or some other contribution done with the homeless, like, okay, well, you need to commit to this many houses, you can't get that many jobs, let's talk about everything you just talked about. So thank you for that. I'll, I won't belabor it. Madam Chair has got to keep moving and stuff. But if you come across any white pages or anything that was interesting at your training, please share with us. I mean, you know we like I'll do that. <laughs> okay. I'm good. Okay. Okay. Th thank you so much, Commissioner mm -hmm. Robinson. Commissioner Guida. Yes, uh, thank you, ma'am. Um, Tim, uh, housing and transportation and work should be coordinated. Housing should be <coughs> close to the bus system <coughs> or, or the transportation system so they can walk to that and catch the, the buses and go where they need to go. Um, instead of putting them in remote areas. Um, are there grants now for housing? Because I know we, uh, in the 2019 budget, I think there's 200,000 that was uh, <coughs> dedicated to y'all. So we are constantly looking for housing resources, whether they be grants, whether they be partnerships, whether they be whatever. You are absolutely right. A, and I'm probably going to use this incorrectly for this group, I apologize, but I would call that a high value target. Uh, a house that is close or housing resources that are close to transportation, obviously on a scale, is much more valuable to a program like mine and to a lot of people uh, than a house out in a remote area. Uh, right now, we are at a place where we are 
The only word that comes to mind is desperate uh, for housing because we're taking whatever resources we can get. And so I think that's an accurate term to use. Uh, but as we come up with a long-term stable approach, we do need to coordinate housing next to transportation yes. that's coordinated next to a job center or connected to a job center, uh, which we have the option of doing as the Douglas County buses come online. Uh, and I'm looking forward to working with the transportation department to make sure that we're getting those resources plugged in. And you know, we're actually <coughs> trying to bring van pools online for our participants now that are kind of pooling in jobs where they're at uh, so that we can use the van pool as well as the bus system. So all of those things are vitally important. Mm -hmm. uh, and as we try to build something long-term, that's what we're gonna to try to do. Tomorrow, I'm literally going to learn. Uh, there's this HUD program that's out there that apparently nobody in the state's aware of. It could be new. I don't, I know very little about it. I will absolutely share what we get tomorrow. Uh, Where with, is it gonna be at? You know, this is online, so I don't have to travel for this. So I'll be in my office watching this. Uh, sequestered, I'll have the door shut and try to get everybody to leave us alone for an hour or two so I can bring some of my team members in and we can uh, group think over this problem and say, is this a resource that we can use here in Douglas County and to what scale? You know, is this a resource for one residence? Is this four beds? Is this, you know, 10 residences? Is it 40 beds? Uh, that's a very important question for us. Well, when you were talking about HUD, I'm thinking they're just scattered everywhere. <laughs> mm -hmm. And they may not be on the bus route. And uh, so I think the concentration should be on getting them as close to uh, transportation, public <coughs> transportation, as possible. So you kill two birds with one stone. Absolutely. So, all right. But uh, right now, there's no grants for the housing? There is no grant from the Criminal Justice Coordinating Council for housing. Uh, there is not a grant from HUD that I'm aware of for housing, but this program might activate something. You know, <coughs> we've looked at housing with this Board of Commissioners over um, with some uh, redevelopment authority money, and it was determined at that time that, that wasn't a good fit for this county. I'll continue to bring those options as we see them. That's what I see as my job to do, is to bring to you an option and say, this is what's possible in Douglas County. This is where other people are getting housing. This is how our uh, community services board got housing. And this is how these nonprofits are getting housing. I'll continue to collect all that information that I can. And as identifiable real pieces of property come available, we'll look at each one of them and say, you know, this is what we think we can do with this piece of property. And do we do that or not will be entirely your decision and we'll support that. But it is my job, I believe, to bring those options to you and say housing is ultimately important to us. And this is what we got today. And this is what we can work for in the future. Okay, okay. thank you so much. And um, Mr. Pruitt, if, uh, if you needed some additional, additional information, please feel free to reach out to Ray Lightfoot with the Community Service Board. But we are definitely, uh, he's uh, pretty astute with uh, HUD because we have some HUD housing here in Douglas County, about 88 units, and he's pretty familiar with the process, so he needs some additional. Lightfoot and I are on speed dial together now. He's a, good, he's, he's a great good resource. Oh. <laughs> All right, so we'll move on to your next item, tab number 18, authorization for the Felony Accountability Court Office, Department 234, to hire a full-time executive assistant with benefits and amend the budget. Could you tell us a little bit about this, Mr. Pruitt? So the amend the budget really belongs to the first piece where we're talking about bringing in the additional revenue. This is really using the existing money we have in our budget right now. Uh, as Commissioner Guider pointed out, we have tremendous support from the Board of Commissioners but Judge McLean, when he's asking for that at your constitutional officer's retreat and he's looking at what's needed for the budget to move forward, he's just asking for a pot of money. He's just saying, I need about this much to continue the ongoing growth of the accountability courts. This is solidifying one of those pieces. We can very easily articulate that our staff needs the assistance and support uh, to focus on what they're great at and allow us to get some of these routine things handled with an administrative system. Okay, so in essence, this is budget neutral. Is this will be budget neutral. This okay. will be existing funding uh, that's already there. We're not asking for any additional money for this position. Okay, thank you so much, Commissioner uh, Ryder. Uh, Tim, is there a grant that uh, you might could fund this through? Uh, 
adding personnel is never uh, budget neutral. It may be for this year, but then it, it impacts the budgets from here on out. Understood. So I, I was just wondering, is there uh, no grant that would uh, help you with your accountability court and the assistance that you need? So I did ask for this in our grant from last year. That was not a funded line item. Uh, I will continue to ask for this for years to come. I cannot obviously say, well, next year they're going to give us money for that position because I have no idea what their will will be for next year. Uh, we will continue to do that as we go uh, every year, asking to support those operations with grants where possible. Uh, for us, I know that uh, I am taking staff away from, in some cases, life-saving measures, in many cases, critically important measures, so that we are trying to deal with administration, uh, so that we're trying to deal with making sure that uh, you know a particular line is in the right place or uh, that uh, invoices are paid with vendors properly. Right now, I'm leaning heavily on the support staff with Judge McLean and Judge Adams. Uh, but their assistance are needed for the regular operations of court. So they're taking on additional responsibilities for us that I'm hoping to offload from them into this position. But this, this is a new position. This is a new and, position. You know, we just wrote the DA over the coals about his new position. So I'm going to be asking you pretty Equal, much the same thing. I understand. Um, was this a BIR? In your budget? This was, this is basically taking a piece of the BIR. There was a pot of money that was in our BIR. It was not designated for anything other than continued growth and support. And this is taking that and solidifying it into this position and saying, this is what we should be using this money for. It's the highest and best use of these funds at this time. Because I was, I was under the impression it was for housing that was in the budget is am I wrong? this is not from the two hundred thousand this is from in your this is not from eight ten which is yes. where that two hundred thousand sits. Okay. This is from two thirty four where we have money in our other professional services line items <laughs> right now. Okay, but you didn't ask for a <coughs> uh, a full time employee as a BR. I did not ask in the budget cycle for a full-time employee as a BR. That is correct. This is the position that Judge McLean spoke about in the Constitutional Officers Retreat. Uh, that was in his presentation and who, and, and the person that he was ended up asking for. Uh, as I tried to figure out what he wanted me to request in the budget cycle, it was more of a request for a set of money mm -hmm. to continue the support of the accountability courts and we will figure out how we carve that money up through the year. Could this not be done with a uh, part-time employee? Uh, you know what I'm uh, I think that any support is better than no support. Well, there's no uh, money attached to this item. Uh, how much money are you talking about? Uh, we always ask that. That is absolutely <laughs> correct. And uh, working with Mr. Perry and his staff, we have our entry-level salary at this at $36,714.08. Is that with uh, perks? <coughs> is that with no. perks uh, or is that... Benefits would be on top of that money. Be on top of that? Yes, ma'am. Um, but have, have you, again, I'm going to ask, did you consider a part-time employee uh, to begin with, you work under 30 hours. The that needs. Way you don't have to pay the benefit. <coughs> and then maybe it could work into a full time employee. We would be willing to consider that, absolutely. The needs are enough for a full time employee, but that means by necessity that the needs are also sufficient for a part time employee. Oh, I, I understand the needs, and so does all the other departments. Absolutely. Uh, that did not get requested personnel. Understood. And we turned them down, uh, or, you know, we can't fund them, so that's why I'm just trying to find uh, common ground here. Understood. Not a problem. So you would not be uh, against a part-time without the perks? We would not. We will ask for whatever support we can get. Mm -hmm. All right. I yield back. Thank you.
Oh, thank you, Commissioner Gunner. Um, Vice Chairman Robinson. Yeah, well, I want to come back to um, a clarification on what that $200,000 was, because obviously I, I, I carried that forward. That 200000 was deliberately and specifically for housing and services. Please confirm, Director Holman. Correct. Well, it was kind of a generic, um, I believe, Michelle, do you know? Is it a housing and services, yeah. Sanctuary Village? I think so, but I don't think it was tied to anything specific. It was very generic. Mm -hmm. Right. Let, let, let me clarify. I've got my notes. It, I'm telling you what it is. It was for housing and services. Go pull the tapes. I was clear as many times as I said, housing and services. There was no restriction, and it was 200000 So I wanted to make sure you, you can confirm that, but I, I'm, I, I'm sure of what I made my motion for. Um, there is no confusion. You had housing and services. So my question becomes, uh, and we'll let them clarify or, 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 or say I'm wrong. Um, with housing and services, $200,000, that could be used. That was the whole point. I gave the judge flexibility. There, were, there was no constraints. There was no prohibition on the use of that money, housing and services. So I'm, I'm back to this whole notion of housing. And I appreciate the spirited approach to this, guys. But at some point, it's, and you hear me say it all the time, uh, at least to just plain, that, that this approach is not scalable. I appreciate we acting like a nonprofit. I appreciate that we're trying to find money over here in this little pocket and you look grant funding. I'm like, guys, that's not scalable. That's not institutionalized the way you're talking about we're trying to really deal with this. It becomes symbolic. So I just sit back and wait for, well, okay, I'm at least setting up the framework. I'm putting, okay, but just make sure we have a proper account that we get their money. Because at some point you gotta come to a point where it becomes a true port. It becomes like, okay, are y'all gonna be committed to this or not? When we first started this whole process, I asked all of our commissioners at that time, are we committed to the accountability courts? Because if we do this, we got to go all in. Right? So I, I'm still, I want to make sure we're sort of like dancing around this. And I'm trying to, you know, if, you, if you're trying to, if the public is trying to read the commissioner's direction, are they committed to accountability courts or are we just going through the motion? It's a feel good. Right? We're selling that this trade off and it's like, yeah, but. Come on, guys, where's the skill at? You need full-time people, you need housing to do this right, or we just sort of in this, this we're in an early stage where we're just sort of healing ourselves. It sounds like you're at a point where you're really ready to ramp. You're what, two years in, three years in? You've Four got, years in. Three years in, you got a drug and DUI, then you got a mental health court, and they're all in there some kind of way, right? Um, and there's a distinguishing difference. And again, I'll keep pushing on this to say, okay, when will you scale, because we have to anticipate that. This is a court that was mandated by the state. This ain't something discretionary that we're sitting around like, well, maybe we will, maybe we won't. This is a court that was came down from the state that pretty much was unfunded. Yes, they're providing some grants, and they're sort of, well, well, but I'm trying to you know, anticipate this. So uh, one more time, long-term capital planning, let's make sure we continue to have that bucket there that this, at, at some point there will be a reconciliation that says, okay, we need serious funding for this to really make this work, if we're serious. Commissioner Robinson, yes. I looked it up, and yes, it says continued expansion, felony drug court housing and services, $200,000. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Sounds good. Any other Commissioner? Yes, and, and I respect what the Commissioner is saying. We have all these elected officials coming to us saying they need help. A court is a court. A DA is a court. So, uh, and the accountability courts are not mandated by the state, are they? I think they're uh, <coughs> voluntary by, uh, from the county to establish them. I don't think it's a mandatory <coughs> court. At this time, the uh, state incentivized accountability courts rather than. Uh, dictating accountability courts. Right. So but they provided additional monies and, and raises and I'm, and I'm not I'm not saying that they're not important, but we've got to treat everybody the same way. We're, if we're going to, you know, uh, question the DA about his full-time employee that he uh, is bringing, he'd like to bring home, then we've got to question him too, just because they are accountability court. Um, but uh, 
I recall when we first started out with the accountability court, they were not going to cost us anything <laughs> because we got grants. The housing wasn't going to cost anything, you know. But here we are down the road, and it is costing the taxpayers of Douglas County. And we're charged with making sure that we maintain this budget uh, in accordance to the revenue coming in and the services that are certainly needed. And there's, I have nothing against the accountability court. I have suggested other things for the accountability court. I would like to see us buy an old motel and put a bunch of people at the same place rather than run it scattered them all over the county. But uh, I'm just saying, um, when we add a person, um, it was it in the budget, it was it, it, services is very broad, very broad. But when we talk about adding personnel, we're talking about affecting every budget from here on out. And that's why I was trying to get you what you need, but also not impact the, the budget so much. Uh, by starting out smaller and maybe it can work into maybe you can get a grant next year to make that a that part time employee a full time employee. But we just have to be fair with everybody. We can't pick our projects and say, I'm for this but I'm not for that. So we, we just have to be fair is all I'm saying. And equal. So I yield back. Thank you so much, Commissioner Bradley. I'm going to wrap it up and then we'll move on to the next one. I was understanding the VA that we would allow him to move forward with his, with his request and just look at his existing money that he had in his budget and next year offset. So I think he left pretty happy because he, does, he will have that full-time position. And then if I look at your position, I thought you said budget neutral. That tells me you have some dollars in there that will have no impact going forward because those dollars that you're going to just isolate and just utilize them. So it sounds like it's just <coughs> some dollars in there that were not earmarked specifically. It's just you had some cash sitting there and you want to utilize it for this position. So it sounds like it's a win-win on both of you and the VA. Just by my interpretation, I'm hoping is that I'll agree with that. N no <coughs> movement next year at all, correct? That's why I, I want the Board of Commissioners to understand that. So you're saying that if we allocate this money today, because it's already in your budget, you will not ask for any additional money next year. What I'm saying is what you will hear from Judge McLean and possibly from Judge Adams next year is not give me this very large piece of money, but give me a piece of money minus this piece that goes forward because what that large piece of money needs to do is be pushed into housing, treatment, personnel. We need to build those support services as we go forward so that they're not just a, an ethos of give me a, a pot of money, but I can prove to you this is what that money is being used for and it needs to be on those lines. And so I'm breaking that out for you. That's what I'm trying to do. No, sure. I just clarify yeah, this to, to your point. And this is, yeah, this is my point, Don. Treat this like a, a company. Treat it like a business model. At some point, it has to become sustainable. At some point, it requires real commitment, right? Uh, my, my comment was it, 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 it wasn't a, a challenge um, uh, to anybody else in equal way. But at some point, you got ten dollars what we need, one dollar. Somebody's going to be left out with a musical chair. It becomes the priority of the full board of commissioners on which direction and who gets what. There is no splitting equally across because it's not. So let's let's put that to the side. Specifically to you, what I what I'm trying to help the board understand, as I said three years ago, back in people four five, four years ago when I was in 2015 in that very first um, um, criminal justice reform act class at ACCG, and and I listened to the ladies and says, okay, oh God, they. Ooh, this is about money. This wasn't about we really care about the people. They said we cannot sustain putting people in jail. This is, they've been in here 30 years and the, it's, the burden is, is too great. Let's keep this real. Right, so they pushed it down here locally. It was pushed down here. Like, y'all solve this thing. We'll give you a little money. But at some point, so I'm looking at this over time. Guys, we can either get ahead of this and at least plan for it, or we can just sort of pretend like, okay, we're just going to work through this. Your need is going to keep growing. The pipeline is there. It's there. The question is, how committed are we to this? This is a policy decision, right? Really. I appreciate your one-off needs. Let you judge keep doing what you got. But at some point, the Board of Commissioners has to sit here and say, in light of everything else, where will the appropriations go? 
where will the policy shift? Well, are we going to liberalize or are we going to prohibit and bring it in? And so I'm looking at this and I'm like, okay, gosh, y'all don't need money for housing. They don't need money for these people to keep up with all these case management. And even though you're triage, you're working through CSB, it's like, okay, this is going to get big. Oh, my God. 20% of the people in the jail don't even need to be there. I'm like, okay. So I'm trying to plan for it. I'm trying to have a conversation today so that y'all are emotionally beyond the rhetoric. And you're like, okay, if you're committed to this, you need to plan for it. This is what we get measured for when people look at our ratings. They look at our decision making financially and say, okay, did you not see that? Did you not see that court coming online? So anyway, Madam Chair, I, I just want to clarify, one is not related to the other. Each position, each commissioner has to take their position on what they believe is priority. There is no we. The we becomes when we each individually cast our vote. Whatever the consensus is, that's what it turns out. We've had this conversation before. But I want to move on, Madam Chair. Let me yield. One last piece of information for the yes. board to consider. Mm -hmm. If you look at the last four years of the average jail, daily inmate population at the Douglas County Jail, and you look at the number of people that we have court, in court, you will see that as we increase the number of people in court, the number of people in jail are decreasing. Mm -hmm. Last year we were, and I don't have anybody from the Sheriff's Department here to confirm this, last year we were about 750 people every day in the jail. Today we're about 650 people every day in the jail. I've got 104 people in court. So the metrics can work and, and there is definitely cost savings at the local level to support the accountability courts. Okay. Thank okay. you so much. Commissioner Carpenter. Thank you. I just have one question. I, I'm assuming this is for Jennifer. So this full time position salary, they have it in their budget for the salary, but would we have to then pull for the benefits? That's my question. You have both salary and benefits in your other professional services that you're going to move to the salary and benefit line item. Correct. correct. And then Mark had sent him an email and just want to, yes, for the record, correct. that we would take that amount, the salary and benefits, out of um, his professional services um, for next year. And that it would reduce his amount that he would get in his other professional services and go into his salary and benefits. For this year. Correct. Yes. I just wanted to make sure I understood that. Yes, I heard you saying that. Okay. Yeah. So, however, um, to Madam Guider's point, then making this a part-time position would then give you extra ben extra money for next year's budget. Is that correct? Well, and I'll Just defer to uh, Ms. Holman because she's wonderful whenever we didn't spend our money for one okay. year. Sometimes she'll let us carry it over for a year. Okay. Um, and so that's a possibility from finance and from the board. Uh, my goal is to be as efficient with the money use that I can be and if it's left over then it'll be left over we're not going to go out and just try to spend money because it's there we're going to spend it on what needs to be spent and that's my costs are largely structured because it takes time to bring, bring people into court it takes time to structure their treatment <clears throat> on a very defined path uh, so I really can't go out and just create expenses within a 30-day period it takes much longer than that so that absolutely would uh, change the amount that I would spend over the year and the number of people that we bring into court. I mean, those are metrics that we would have to pull back on or deal with based on the support services that we've got. Okay. I yield. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Mr. Poole. All right. We'll move on to tab number 19, authorization to approve a contract with Carbine for the public safety of Sea Life E911. Call solution and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents subject to final legal review. Director Whitaker, there you are. Good morning. Good morning. Madam Chair, this is, um, and when I say carbine, it is uh, spelled C A R B Y N E, not carbine. Uh, I misunderstood sometimes when I said it. it's carbine, our next generation 911 call handling solution for the E91 Center. This was in the, it is in the 2019 budget, uh, and what I'm here for today is ask for Madam Chair. Uh, the board signed all related documents uh, subject to final legal review okay. so we may implement this. I also have two representatives from Carbine here this morning if there's any questions that I can answer about the project. Okay, I'm going to ask the representatives if you could just go to the podium if you could so we don't have to make any noise when it's time for questions. The board of Commissioners, you have any questions regarding um, this particular item? 
I, I have a question. I'm just going to ask for clarification. This is for your call system that, uh, with all the computers and stuff like that? that yes, ma'am. This is a component. Uh, it is another, uh, if you will, tool in our toolbox. Most of the time, we're able to locate 911 calls, and there's no problems, there's no uh, anomalies. However, every now and again, we get an anomaly uh, that just does it for whatever reason come through the system. Uh, we're an end user, so if it doesn't get to us for whatever reason through the, the telcos, to the, uh, the tandems, to the trunks, <coughs> as far as the location, we, that's all that we can see on our screen is what we get. What this product does is it allows us to be, um, and I hate to use that example of the pizza man, but uh, uh, why can your pizza man find you but no one can't? Well, this is the same technology. And we have been trying this technology. Uh, the company has uh, been gracious to put us on a trial since January and since then. We have located an intoxicated driver that probably would have more than likely done damage to himself or others one afternoon. Uh, we've also located a, a hit and run driver in Fulton County, a uh, hit and run caller in Fulton County, and also a, a very heated domestic was uh, videotaped by uh, this system. Well, what this system does or what this solution does is once we get a telephone number, the caller, most people call now when they want, they want us, they're trying to get us, so we want to get them, we want to find them. We put this phone number in this system. The, the system sends a text to the caller, the person that called us, and it gives them an option to accept the text. So once they accept that text, it also says, I think the caption is video text. Once they accept that, it opens up a live port to the 911 center. And uh, we're able to see what they're seeing. We're able to see where they are. We're able to see what they're doing. Uh, some hesitation in the future. This is part of the next generation. This is just a little bit of next generation. This is a, the emphasis of just getting our feet wet in next generation. It's going to allow us, uh, allow us to, to uh, export this information to the, to the user agencies as well, to the sheriff's office, to the fire department, uh, the EMS department. Uh, it's going to introduce a new psychology into the 911 center because now people are going to say, hey, I just came into my house and look what I found, or look at this medical wound, or or look at look at this this suicide or whatever you have. So the now one dispatchers and usages here now they're going to see it. So what we'll be able to do though, the, the good side of that is we'll be able to show the fire, the police department. Uh, if we get a lookout that they videotape, maybe someone witnesses an armed robbery and they videotape this. Now we'll be able to export that information back to the to the field agencies. So now we don't have we we can describe it over the radio. But now they've also got a text, a picture, a video to go on as well, and that that that's what next generation is to be able to say, to be able to to receive and, and send JPEGs, MPEGs, video, audio, everything for the total 911 solution, and and this is just a little bit of it. And as I said, we've tried, we've been on trial since January, and so far it's it's worked to our satisfaction uh, as far as being able to locate. Uh, people that we wouldn't be able to otherwise locate with our conventional 911 trunks and equipment. Does this have anything to do where you can track the like, fire trucks and the ambulances, where they are? That, that is another system that we have in place that, that, that's already in place okay. with uh, the fire department, the police department, and the sheriff's office. But that's separate from this. All right. We just did an update on that. So I thought maybe this was part of that. Mobile data terminals and, and uh -huh. MVPs, <laughs> MVPs and things. So that is separate from this. This is this is for the, the caller, and, and and this is for the caller to get information now one, and for us to be able to locate the caller. But they have to accept that. Yes, ma'am. They have to you accept can't just the text. Hack into it. No, ma'am. There's, there's no there's no big brother in this, and we we discussed this at length. I told uh, Chad Labrie with uh, with Carbine that. That was going to be one of the first questions was, can we just track people for no apparent reason? Yeah. Because the first thing I said was, can my employees put my number in here and track me? And they said, no, they can't. Uh, so most people call 911. They want 911. They want to be located. That's that's the good side of this is they're not trying to avoid 911. They want us to find them. And as I said, most of the time we can. But we're going to get that anomaly. They use their phone. <coughs> they actually connect to their phone. And then they can scan an area and See. Yes, ma'am. Oh, okay. Yes, ma'am. When we when we tested it initially, I drove all over the county 
uh, I had my cell phone and them out and just videotaped and they, they knew where I was they were telling me we would we know where you are uh, that's an advantage to it if you've got a dispatcher or, or someone that knows where that is but as far as um, it also gives us uh, I may not have covered this it gives us XY coordinates very accurate location coordinates and it's also going to give X, Y, and Z coordinates in the future. In other words, we're going to get a lat long and elevation. So in a big city like Douglasville, Douglas County, we don't have tall high rise buildings yet, but one day we might. But in Atlanta, places where they have high elevated structures, mm -hmm. That's almost impossible. If we were to give the fire department just X, Y coordinates, we could send them to the ground plot of that location. They could find the, the footprint on a map. But as far as what story it's on, now we will get that in the future as well, too. So we'll know if it's on the 13th versus the 30th story. Uh, but um, th this, uh, this is it's in the beginning, as I said. Uh, Carbine has actually partnered with, a, uh, with another company called Rapid SOS, if you've heard that. And uh, if you, I don't know if you ever heard about them, but they're doing a lot of great things in next gen. And um, I don't know if, if Chad, uh, if you want to go to, into it or not, but, but we will we will have that technology available to us as well. But you you have your own funding, so this doesn't yes, impact the county budget. No, ma'am. This comes from the fee. This is the nine one one budget. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Very interesting, though. <laughs> Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. Thank you, Chad. Thank you. Thank you for what y'all are doing to take us into the 21st century. We Thank love you. that. Vice Chair, I didn't see you. I'm so sorry. I got to turn my head. No, Vice <coughs> Chairman has a question for you. Yeah, I, it, it, interesting. I, we, we had this conversation about body cams a couple of years ago. Some of you guys remember. And, um, you know, um, in, in, in Basin, <coughs> There's something about, and the only reason this strikes me because I watched Snowden last night, and, and so this is on my, it's on my spirit. All right, so I'm, I'm looking at government and collection of information. All right, let's keep this very, I mean, it's great to be enamored by technology, but it, it's the use of the technology is, is what, what, what gets us in trouble sometimes. So my question is, what happens, there's storage, what do you do with this information? Uh, we say, that we won't use it as, but where is the storage? I mean, what, what, what happens to the information when you record, you're finding information, you've got a lot of storage. I, that, that, that opens things up that I've got to think about between now and tomorrow that I'm, I'm not quite like, what now? And again, we're so caught in the Look what the technology can do. It's not could we do it, but should we do it, and are we ready for this? And you're saying you've thought through this, but I haven't heard the thinking that you thought through this. You just said you did, but what did y'all discover? Was there anybody else out there that sort of objected to this um, use of this tool? I'm sure since you thought about it, you guys are in the marketplace that somebody can actually speak to the concerns that we would have around certain people's rights in this live court. Can somebody speak to that? So um, all of the, the entire solution is stored on Amazon GovCloud, which is certified by Siege of Security, as well as the FBI. So there is no in-house storage uh, at uh, Douglas County uh, uh, Regional Communication, so that, um, that's not a non-issue there. Um, like I said, this is all certified within the Gov Cloud. They have access to pull the records on the administrative level, just like you have today with your recordings. Somebody calls 911, everything's recorded. That information is used for uh, public safety purposes only for court cases. This is no different than that uh, than that solution. The other piece that um, Director Wick was uh, speaking of was, which was the video piece. We don't pop video in the dispatcher space. Okay, so for instance, he was talking about uh, an incident that somebody may be calling in, and there was a suicide that's happening. That will still be recorded, even though the dispatcher does not choose to see it. That is a, that is a dispatcher driven um, or policy driven at the center, whether they will or will not view, uh, depending on what is needed uh, for information. But it is stored for later on down the road within uh, any type of prosecution, any investigative uh, reasons, detectives, or anything like that. But it's totally stored on a uh, GovCloud 
solution. And, and that's what I'm hearing that we're going to have this live court and it's just going to pop. I'm like, what now? Yeah. And you're going to expose what? And, and yes. that's it. It, it. Again, we're so caught up about the technology. It's like, okay, y'all know what y'all saying? So I need a little bit more comfort around its use, um, how it is um, put, you know, it, it has to be strategic and have a very pragmatic approach to, to its use, not just something, look at this, look at this neat, look, like, like well, quick time or whatever it's called, look, 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 it's like, no, y'all know what y'all doing. Right. It's about privacy. Um, yes. and, and while I appreciate the safety, the public safety, there's a balance, right? We're trying to balance both. And I just wanted to hear what you had to say regarding this. Yeah. I won't belabor it. I need, I need to look at this little <coughs> deep by tomorrow. But I got it. Um, I'm just, hmm. Okay. And, and that's why uh, when you speak about privacy, that is why it is done through this mechanism with the yeah. text message going to the call to the caller themselves. Yep. They are authorizing you to see their location and they are authorizing you to see their video camera. They can, they can, there's two choices that pops up. Do you want to provide your location? Yes, no. Do you want to provide your video? Yes, no. So they may want to provide their location but they may not want to provide their video. This is all authorized by the caller. I get it, it's, a, it's an extension. I just gotta get my mind around it, but I appreciate sure. it. I just, but I had to ask that tough question about, we're, we're, it's not, it's about rights, and it's always not monetary rights, and, and there's other parts of um, government that we have to look out for, so we're good, thank you. Commissioner Robinson, if I yes, might please. say one more thing. Yes. If you ever watch the 11 Live 9 stories that they show, one of the main stories they show centers around a young lady that drowned in her car in Alpharetta in a creek because they couldn't find her. Um, and I'm not saying that if they had the system, they would have found her, but I think that they would have had a lot more uh, ability to be able to find her. And and that, that is my whole reason for coming to y'all today is if we ever get in that situation, I don't want to put a citizen to where we can't locate them or a, a dispatcher in the position where they're having to go through the, the remorse of not being able to find that, that caller. And this system is one more tool in our toolbox that will take that, it, 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 that, that faction out. That will take, a, um, it will give us another ability that we never had. Duly noted. I'm good. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. So much. Thank you so much, Thank Ted. you, ma'am. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. In the first century. All right. Uh, tab number 20. Authorization to amend the contract with Bold Plain to add the multi jurisdictional hazard mitigation uh, <coughs> data to cost $25,000 and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Director Mill Hall. Yes, this is a. We just want to. Currently, we're using the Bold Plain for our continuity of operation plan for the several departments and also our, just started with, them, with our emergency operations plan. We've been very happy with them. <coughs> and the next plan I've got to update is emergency, I mean, the hazard mitigation plan. This is grant funded of 24 of the 25,000 was previously approved and I have the other thousand dollars in my budget so this will not be any um, any other, um, I haven't moved me, I'm not asking for any more money, I'm just asking to add this module to our new planning software. Okay, any questions from the board? All right, sounds like a no brainer. Appreciate you doing that. Thank you. Uh, tab number 21, approval of claims for property tax refund as recommended by the Board of Assessors Director Walter. I will do this morning. Wonderful, Madam Chair, how about you? Oh, pretty good. Oh, well, it's evening now, I guess. It's afternoon. <coughs> it's afternoon. <coughs> I'm trying. Well, y'all when I'm asking you to give away some money <laughs> or uh, give credit. <coughs> These are necessary from time to time. There's two different requests. Parcel 173511, Rooker Riverside. Refund of $14,478.85 for tax year 2018. We overvalued the property because we failed to apply some adjustments that were usually applied for property, <coughs> for flood blame, for setbacks, for bad topography. <coughs> and sometimes these are uh, typically applied because it limits the use of property in terms of building and that kind of thing. We did an evaluation of the property more thoroughly and met with the tax reps from Rook Riverside and verified information and this is justified in our opinion. This was approved by the Board of Assessors and the Tax Commission. Second was parcel 625-18-11, PPC Realty LLC. 
Pre-claim the amount of $15,983.11 for tax year 2018. These are commercial buildings on this property. We have it classified as an industrial light manufacturing building, which is priced out in typically on our cost structure system at, in the 50s, $55 a square foot on average. But it's really a storage warehouse. I mean, it's right over around $45 a square foot. So that difference is the reason we have to ask for a refund in this case. We had the building classified incorrectly. So I think these are properly before you. The Board of Assessors approved them. And the Test Commissioner also gave his concurrence. Okay. Any questions for the Board of Commissioners? Uh, Commissioner Carson. Mm -hmm. My question for you, um, Mr. Walter, is this a credit refund or are we actually cutting checks? Got the cut checks on these two. Gotcha. Okay. My other question for you is the, um, jog my memory if you can, you were requesting some software that could kind of help mitigate these types of things in, in the future, were you not? <coughs> I'm trying to remember, we have, we have requested uh, software in the past, mm -hmm. but I don't, uh, I'm not sure that was the... Uh, okay, because uh, from my memory, and we go, we go through a lot, but I think you were requesting software that could allow you to look at building structures or topography for... We, we have done that, yes we have. Okay. Did you and, get that software? And our GIS system has really gotten, uh, we've gotten some software that does help us with that. Mm -hmm. But this was going to be some add-ons that we, <coughs> we, we uh, at one time, I think we put it before you one time, mm -hmm. and it got cut. And we were talking to the company again for this year, but we finally decided not to put it in the budget. We didn't get the information from them until after the budget uh, time to submit was given to us. Okay. So it's something we uh, may bring before you again next year. Okay. Okay. I'm glad you did remind me of that. Not a problem. Yeah, because we want to try to alleviate these types of things so if we have accurate records and if those resources would help us to do that, then I'm all about using those resources so we can not have to cut 30000 but thank you. I yield back. Is this the map project? project? I'm not sure. sure. There was something that was asked for last year, or for this year's budget. It was on the revisit. Mm -hmm. 25000 The map project. Yeah. I'm sorry. I was so, out of I just need to look at that while she was. So you're saying that would have cost us only 25000 If that's what this was, it says map project 25000 Okay. And like you said, we're paying out 30. You're going to go this particular. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 We know that that's the priority mm -hmm. going forward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Any other questions? Thank you, Director. Thank you so Have much. a good day. Yeah. All right. We'll move on to tab number 22 authorization to approve change order number one with CW Matthews in the amount of $86,158.85 for additional quantities of materials and field modifications required for the Stuart Mill and Nancy Rhodes intersection and project project funded uh, through 2002 squashed funds and authorized the chairman to sign all related documents. Director Valentine. Yes, good afternoon, uh, good Madam afternoon. Chair and Commissioners. Uh, this, this item uh, resulted from, again, variance in the quantities as when we bid projects out, it's really an estimate, the best estimate we can come up with as to what is going to be incurred out in the field. And this will catch us up to where we are in the construction phase, uh, all of the field adjustments that have been necessary today. <coughs> okay. Commissioner. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Gaddle, you have a comment. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, um, Miguel, this is uh, a 2002 project, right? Yes. So do we have the funds to go in the 2002 splash to pay for this change order? That is my understanding that there are sufficient funds uh, to cover this. 
and this is the scope of the job uh, increase? Uh, not the scope, not the scope as such. The, the scope remains basically the same, but uh, because of the time that is taken from the original concept and the original design to when it went to construction, there are variances between what the plan called for and things that have changed out in the field. And so we're having to adjust to be able to get the project constructed properly. So they're about 90% finished with this project, are they not? They're putting curbing now. They're pretty far along, and, and as I indicated, this uh, gets us up to date with all the changes that we have incurred. It is our goal and our hope <coughs> that there would be no additional changes. Uh, but I can't promise that, but uh, but this catches us up to where we are uh, on the project. Okay, I'm glad to see that project <laughs> coming to fruition. <coughs> so, uh, all right, thank you. I get back. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Let's turn the mics on. Yeah, and, and Miguel, to that point, we, we discussed this in the transportation committee, correct? That is correct. All right, and, and inside of that, when this came forth as a recommendation, <coughs> this is 2002, right? That 17 is years ago. Mm -hmm. Right. I'm, I'm driving home, you know, I'll get the Lee Road in a couple of weeks, but you, you, you get my point, which is, this is 17 years, right? We're just now able to clean up, and I appreciate you coming on board and, and trying to get some of this stuff just un, un fixed. I mean, we're talking about a generation um, of stuff that, that lags in government sometimes, and we, we get so close that we can't see like that, that's not really the most acceptable. Uh, yes, we went through a recession, but <coughs> money that was already funded two spots ago. Two spots. Right? And so I try to bring home context sometimes that, okay, are y'all really looking at this the right way? Um, uh, is there anything else that we, so to bring this full circle, is there any more money, Jennifer, you can help them confirm this? Uh, for the 2002 spots, it only the transportation category. Is there any outstanding money either in our CTF or some type of side account left? The 2002 <coughs> SPLOSS, that's what I was just pulling up. Um, probably need to get with you and Michelle to talk about it because I'm not showing that there's, there's money available for this change order the way that it's currently in the system. It's showing that there's a, a negative 14,000 in there right now. So we definitely need to make sure that we're all on the same page before this gets approved tomorrow so that we know if there needs funds need to come from somewhere, it's not going to be in the SWAS fund. Okay. The, my, in my discussions, uh, my understanding was that there was funding. And it could be an issue of where, what items were expended and which were captured but not fully uh, uh, dispersed. Yeah, there's a large encumbrance out there of about 1.5. Some of that may need to be cleaned up. But to answer your question, the 2002 SWAL, that that's the only project that is active, and that's the only money that's available is for this Stewart Mill. <coughs> is that correct? In the transportation section. In the transportation section. Okay. So, so we don't repeat Lee Road. And this records out. We cannot have two sets of books and two sets of numbers. Let's make sure you two align on what this is uh, before tomorrow. So we're clear, please. Yes. Mm -hmm. Madam Chair? Yes, absolutely. I'm good. Right. You guys know what you need to do. Okay. All right. Well, I'm move on to the next item in the interest of time. Tab number 23, authorization to approve an agreement to purchase real estate to acquire <coughs> right away in easement of parcel 0158025009. Located at 2948 Bright Star in connection with John West Bright Star Road Intersection Improvement Project, funded through the 2016 SPLOSH funds and authorized the chairman to sign all related documents. Director Valentin again. Yes, uh, Madam Chair, this is uh, yet another uh, parcel that we've been able to come to an agreement with, mm -hmm. uh, with the owner on, uh, that we need in connection with that project. And I believe we approved two last. Uh, Right. We have we have a total of six that have been approved so, so far. far. Okay. And six. this will make number seven. Number seven. Okay. Board commissioners, your okay? I see you. Your hand, board commissioners. No, I thought it. We just approved one last time. But <laughs> anyway, actually, he's got a total of six. So this will be number seven. Total of six. But we need two or four last. 
time. I remember reading all these addresses. Yeah. Thank you. I believe it was four. All right. We'll move on to the next item, tab number 24, authorization to approve an agreement to purchase real estate to acquire the right of way and easements on parcel 01580250003, located at 2963 uh, Bright Star Road in connection with John West Bright Star. Uh, road construction improvement project funded through the 2016 SPLOST and authorized the chairman to sign all related documents. Director Valentin again. Yeah, yes, Madam Chair. This this will be parcel number, well, this will bring us up to a total of eight parcels that we have uh, mm -hmm. reached an agreement on, on that project. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a total of two additional parcels outstanding. Uh, there is a possibility that we may be able to eliminate one of those, so we may be very close uh, to completing the right of way acquisition in this bill. Very good. Any questions from the board? Okay, this is pretty self explanatory. You just acquired them. This will be a, the acquirement of number eight. Okay. Um, tab number 25 authorization to approve an intergovernmental agreement with the city of Douglasville to install a northbound white turn lane on Highway 5 at Douglas Boulevard and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents subject to final legal review. <coughs> Uh, yes, uh, Madam Chair, this, uh, there was some discussion obviously at the last board meeting as well and uh, either they were watching the program or somebody uh, reached out to them and uh, the, the city has now agreed to participate in the project. <laughs> they really, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> they were, they were su certainly supportive of the project all along and, and I have had personally uh, discussions over the year, uh, the previous year, <coughs> with them, and, and so had uh, Mark Teal and other staff. And so, but uh, this solidifies their support uh, by agreeing to contribute uh, up to 50% of the cost of the project, uh, up to a total of 600000 Okay. Any questions or comments from the board commissioners? I believe you said awesome. Um, awesome. Um, very good. All right. Thank you. That was a good win. And thank you so much, Director Valentino. And last but not you have any, did I hear you say something? Yes, sure. Okay. Good. Last but not least, tab number 26, authorization to approve change order number one <coughs> with loose uh, design in the amount of $6,500 for additional services related to park renovations through 2016 splash bonds and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Director Peacock, could you tell us about this? Yes, Madam Chairman. Uh, we entered into a professional service agreement with Loos Design to do the design for the Fair Play lights that were, were wanted to have installed. They pre presented us with an agreement that had different tiers of payments. Uh, we initially accepted the first two tiers uh, and had a purchase order in place for $12,000 for them to do that work for us at Fair Play. Uh, we then saw that we also wanted them to help with our pre-bid meeting and to evaluate the bids and also do some uh, uh, construction meetings uh, as that process occurred. And they did those things. So we're asking that uh, the board uh, approve the, uh, the additional third tier payment of $6,500 to Lowe's. Okay, cool. okay, any comment from the Board of Commissioners? Yeah. Vice Chairman Ross. Yeah, it is. Okay, we'll go come back to professional services. So we've got this professional service that we just engaged. Um, now, they, they're doing the work or they're facilitating the work? What about this here? Uh, from the design <coughs> stands, they're doing the work. They're doing the work. Yes. They're doing the work. And, and, and so you said they help with the bids or? Uh, they help with uh, preparing the bid. Mr. Terry Gable from Moreland Alta Valley worked with them. They, they uh, uh, helped with preparing the bid. They evaluated the bids that came in. Uh, they reviewed the drawings that had uh, been done. And also they uh, agreed that they would attend construction meetings on an as-needed basis. And, and I think that's occurred once with Mr. Gable and them and, and Los. Okay, so they're professional services. I'm trying to get <coughs> what we got Moreland. And we got the guys that actually do the work. We got you guys. <coughs> what role are they playing again? They're the, they're an architect. They're architect. They're an architect, okay. and they're they're designing and determining the placement of the poles, uh, the placements of the lights, the wattage of the lights, all those things that an 
architectural engineering firm would do on a project like this? Why, okay, so the, the, the amount, and I guess my question is, why does it have to come before the Board of Commissioners? Did that fall within a certain threshold that you guys could have done anyway? Uh, the initial agreement that we uh, uh, put in place with them, we only chose Tier 1 and Tier 2 in that agreement. We did not tier, choose Tier 3. But now we employed them, if you will, to do Tier 3, so that's when we had to come back, and it's basically an amendment to the contract through a change order to, to accept the payment for Tier 3 or to pay them for Tier 3. Yeah, I'm just thinking they did what, where does that fall by way of a, a, a procurement that it need to come before the Board of Commissioners? It's a change order. Anytime uh, a change order is uh, placed before us, we bring it to the Commission. Do we have to? I think if you're changing a contract, unless the contract is delegable in some manner, it has to come back. Now, there's two separate things. You got one purchasing ordinances, but this is a matter of contract, meaning that the board has entered into this relationship with Lowe's. If that contract's being amended, regardless of size or scope, it would have to have signature authority to the chairman by this board. So there's two separate things going on here. Well, yeah, I'm, 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 we'll, come, we'll come back to that in person. We go there. I've got a different view on that. Um, everything doesn't have to come back before us. We've already established the authority ahead of time through your policy. It, 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 it just seems like well, it, I get the control. I get legal visibility. But it's like you don't have to do it that way. And so I'm, I'm, I'm like, why do we have to look at me? You have threshold by design. Like if it's an executor and it's within the authority that you can sign up on $5,000 or $10,000 things and that legal needs to cover Madam Chair from an executor, that's fine. But do you need a legislative involvement? And it, it just, we're good. We'll come back to this. I, I just, you, you answered my question, Bill, so I, I'm, I'm not changing. I want to know about the architect. You, you, you clarified that. But we, we're, we're coming back around on that through um, a, a procurement committee. Okay. We're good. Oh, any other questions from the Board of Commissioners? Thank you, Director Peacock. Uh, any other comments from the Board of Commissioners before we move to uh, we'll approach our uh, county attorney? County attorney, do we need to go into the You business? are, Madam Chair, for legal and personnel, but it won't be long. Okay. I promise. Board of Commissioners, do we have a motion to go into a deadly session? Motion. Second. Okay. We have a motion and a second. All in favor, please raise your right hand. Did you have? Uh, I do have a question. That's there. She has a motion. Right. Okay. I would like to apologize to our citizens. We had a temporary uh, technical difficulty. I called for an executive session, but however, one of our uh, um, commissioners had a question, so we had to back up, and then I stopped. We were talking about expense reports and also uh, credit card accessibilities. Uh, accessibility to our commissioners, particularly when they go out of town or have to check in a hotel or what have you, and that information is not uh, prepared in advance, which I've experienced myself and also uh, I believe our commissioner of District 3 uh, as new commissioner is just very embarrassing to uh, check out of a hotel when all the other commissioners are checking out and saying you have a good day and you're sitting there struggling digging in your personal, your own personal credit card. And you may not have any money on that, who knows, yeah. but I, um, I would like to see if we could talk about this uh, openly, and we are. And so I will just uh, yield back to Commissioner Mitchell, who had a question. Well, um, more of a statement that okay. that's kind of what happened, and I, and, and, and I concur that uh, the whole process was a little awkward, because I've never experienced that, where you, 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 you couldn't even take the tax benefit of, of you know, from that, but they did say something. There's a state law or something. I don't know. Mm -hmm. There's a state requirement oh. that any elected official <coughs> that you have to sign affidavits that you will uh, uh, pledge that you will only use the card in certain ways. No, uh, no, not the card. We don't, we don't have the card. So either. But either you will. You talk about the tax. Oh, oh. You okay. talk about the tax issue. Uh, the tax issue. What I'm speaking of is because we didn't have a card, so we had to use our personal card. So that means we couldn't get the tax break. Right. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. that. I mean, it, it sounds as though we need to get the commissioner's credit cards and probably set a limit of maybe ten thousand dollars. I know, but if you're going to be if you're going to be traveling, if you're going to be going to hotels and all these kinds of things, you know, for ACCG, 
and you, you find out that you have to pay for somebody else's room because they left their cart at home, you know, it's just, again, I'll do whatever you want as far as the limit, but that's just a, a standard. It's normally 10000 I understand that even if we get credit cards, those those expenses will have to be approved. Mm -hmm. Just as we do today. Right. right. I don't think anybody will have a problem with yeah. approving the, the credit cards or expenses. It was just the mere fact that we're trying to make sure that we're covered. Convenience. Yes. Yeah. 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 Efficiency. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, you shouldn't have to carry county business, guys. I mean, there's some, some people probably here that do way more travel than we do. They shouldn't have to float county expenses. Right, and especially if, when, when I first came into, you know, back in 99, my first job was a business car coordinator for Prudential Bank, right? These tools have been around 30 years, right? Um, facilitating, um, um, employees facilitating business on behalf of their business, and in this case, the business of people. We shouldn't have to float this thing. And it, it's not just about travel. It's any type of expenditure that you have the authority to be able to do it, whether it's coffee, conversation. Uh, yes. you, they bring coffee, right. they bring conversation. Yeah. It, it, it really doesn't matter, right? It's whatever we have the authority to do so. We have an office that we run no different than it. I mean, I'm, I'm sitting here like, you've got directors that are in here, and the commissioners are talking about $200, $300, $500 uh, to facilitate, and they're having to float. And this shouldn't be that hard. And, and so I, I guess I'm trying to bring this full circle that it was simply a request. We've got to long big, a bigger conversation when this was just a request for a, a, a tool that's already available. Uh, this is not like new authority. Uh, it, it's not like increased authority. It's simply, it's just a tool to facilitate a transaction on behalf of the county that we already have to do, but you sh I shouldn't have to use my personal money to float a county. It's not a nonprofit, I meaning in the sense of the ones that are out there that are not a government, right? And, and so, why are we exposed to floating? Then you have 30 days to put on the agenda, then you got 30 days to get it back. Like, why am I doing this? When there's other people in the county that are facilitating business on behalf of the county with a car. And so, I guess, why is this class excluded other than other people in other areas? The last thing I'll say, in many cases, the commissioners have not wanted to have the credit card. They've chosen not to carry the credit card because they see some liability uh, or they see uh, some negative um, moral clause. They go to jail if they mess up. I mean, <laughs> I mean, obviously, simple. obviously. Mm -hmm. But again, uh, we certainly can provide credit cards. Yeah, I mean, that, I mean as far as moral clause is concerned, there's too much going on there right now. You, you, you don't want to go home. You act right, right? There, there's a certain standard and oath that you say beyond just that oath, but there's an oath that we took. Did you do something wrong? Like, no, you got to get the perp walk. Right? Yeah, and there might be some state standards now because of some issues they had in other counties about a decade or so ago. Uh, and I will say, so it's absolutely clear, I think on that state standard, if I'm not mistaken, you cannot put anything personal on that That's credit card. It can only be expenses related to county business. You, before you even receive you, the card. Yeah, let me finish, Bill. Yeah. Even if you intend to reimburse it, that would be a violation of law. Exactly right. And that's exactly what the affidavit or the agreement that you will need to sign prior to receiving the card says that you will not ever <coughs> put any personal expense on the card. That's, that's for all employees, right? Yes, it's just for any this, this right. is particularly a state statute related to elected officials that are issued credit cards. Mm -hmm. But to his point, though, that should be for everybody to get one. Well, we're not going to give everybody one. Well, everybody, whoever receives one, should that that clear statement should be signed, noted, and and, and, and clear that the only two non-elected officials that have credit cards. Or Mark Till and Lisa Watson, and those are used for county business. And they should Any be clear, other, and they should be clear. They understand they they decide to go to Hawaii. There's um, a policy okay. that they agree to. There's that's, a policy that they agree to. I'm, I'm only saying the policy is across the board. It's just not with really elected officials. It's with everybody who decides to or we give to a credit. The only the only statement I'm making is that there was a state statute that was passed specific to elected officials, and that's what I'm speaking of. Understood. Okay. What you're saying is that state statute, the policy of this board should be across the board. If you get a credit card, that's all the policy. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 But what Bill's pointing out is the state statute came about 
directed solely at elected officials. Understood. It didn't go to the next layer of who else gets a credit card in the local government. And I think that's what Bill's pointing out now. So right. y'all have to extend the policy by y'all. We have an additional policy, just does it require the same signing and affidavit that the elected officials requires? And administratively, we should require that. Of the yeah. 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 yeah, okay. Wait, so we have what? Who else has cards? Sheriffs, DAs, whatever, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. so we got two elected officials, the sheriff and the DA, plus anybody else that maybe they gave it to or authorized, right? They mm -hmm. just they gave them a car and mm -hmm. use it on their job. And somewhere in our, in Fred, somewhere in our HR policy is um, um, if you use this card or use this tool or somewhere in somebody's office, either yours or, or Bill's, that if you use this car inappropriately, there is grounds up to termination or what? That's in my policy. That's in my purchasing policy. Okay, that's in purchasing. Would that okay. be consistent, Fred, with the HR policy? How does that align? It, it would be. It, uh, it could fall under a, uh, a terminatable offense. We have some offenses, uh, offenses listed in the merit mm -hmm. system, and that could very well be one of them. Yeah, for, uh, for, for notice purposes, with Fred, in conjunction with Fred, you still want them to sign when they get the yeah. card oh, that's so that you yes. can prove they had knowledge of that policy yeah. and it wasn't just lying in Bill's right. office right. or they Fred's have. office, right? And if they have it, that's they right. should. That's right. Yes. And we can, we can still get them to sign even correct. if they have it. That's correct. Let's double back on that. You don't mind, Madam Chair? Okay, I will. And also, I just want to make sure and make it very clear, we will continue with our process of making sure that checks are cut in advance. And like you've done in the past, I have a credit card. I use it only for extenuating circumstances to keep the record clear. But it's quite embarrassing when, when we don't have the paperwork in advance. And sometimes it just may be through um, no fault of our own. But I want to make it clear to the citizens, it's not for abuse. It's for those moments when you have. Now I have one, and I believe if we look at my balance now is zero. And I think my limit is 10000 I have no intent to use $10,000 on anything. I don't need to count this money. So I want to make that very clear to all the citizens that's listening. So I believe this is appropriate. You should have a card. I don't want you all digging in your purses and wallets when you're checking out of these hotels at these big conferences with commissioners that are, they have cards. And they said, you're still standing in line and it's embarrassing. Yeah. And you have to dig in your, I said, I don't have any money on my card. I called Lisa, I said, I need you to put it, you know, take care of it. But of course, there's a lot of telephone calling and back and forth. Mm -hmm. I had something, I just thought that we should ante up our game and if our administrative team is going to take care of this, we need to do it in advance and make sure that it's correct before you check out of your hotel. So, uh, Bill, you are going to work with their yes. house? Yes. The first thing I'll do is, is, when Mark gets back, is make sure he's in agreement with what we've said, yeah. uh, and then we'll have the cards issued. Okay. We'll check. If that is Mark. your wish, though. Yeah, right. yeah it okay. is my wish. Okay. All right, so we'll move on, and I'll call again. Um, County mm -hmm. uh, um, Attorney, do we have... Uh, do we need to go in the You do, session? Madam Chair, for legal and uh, personnel. Okay. What of commissioners do we have a motion to go into executive session? So moved. Second. We have a motion in a second. All in favor, please indicate by raising your hand and say aye. 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 Okay, all opposed the same, and the motion carries. Take a 10 minute break and return for your meeting. You please start. There it is. All right, board commissioners, we are back in session. Um, any questions or comments? Yes. Um, Vice Chairman Robinson. Yeah, Madam Chair, I just wanted to clarify just for the record. Uh, we had just a previous question. We were talking about expense reports and we we're talking about um, uh, credit card issuance to the Board of Commissioners. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to clarify what our intent was as commissioners um, to, to request in our own single authority as elected officials uh, the use of a card. I wanted to deal with that. And, and the intent is to submit. Um, in writing to you, visa, in copying the purchasing manager and the county administrator, is that the intent? Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll just have the three in writing. Formalized. Yes. All right. Second point is is that we want to clarify, I think I want to clarify, and I want to come back to my board commissioners, is that there's two things. There are transactions um, and expenses that are incurred in the conducting of travel conferences, etc., mm -hmm. uh, training, uh, that, that sometimes are booked up ahead of time and some things are not. Um, and, and so whatever the meals and all those things that typically exist, that exist. But then there's also our expense accounts. The Board of Commissioners are authorized and allowed to have $300 per month um, to be used for their expenditures. I want to be clear in that 
I use coffee in conversation, or for example, I've got an upcoming town hall, mm -hmm. and I've got a budget of basically $300 per month that I plan on using that to fund our joint town hall mm -hmm. uh, to ensure that we have refreshments there. Uh, a card would be appropriate to use for that in the event that I, I get to do that. Um, not all the time that staff is available. We do things on the weekend. Mm -hmm. Um, there's things that we do spontaneously, say, hey, we need to come here, we have different things. Everything can't be scheduled through staff because I've been plenty of times when they've just, you know, 4.55, 4, 4 everybody rolling out of here. Uh, and, it's, 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 and there's nothing wrong with that. I'm just saying that and it's the weekend, they get they, they get convenient because they, they, they don't work like we do. Right? And I shouldn't have to wait when I'm trying to satisfy the needs of the citizens. So there's the, the account. Um, uh, the expense account that we get, which is $300 per month, this card can also be used for that to facilitate that. Now, with that, is there, um, I want to make sure that we understand that that is the intent. Commissioner Mitchell, Commissioner Crockett, any disagreements, Madam Chair? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I mean, I hear you. I just, I, I was under the impression that you can use it whatever expense, as long as you, you can account for credit, I mean, for uh, county business, it doesn't matter. So unless there's some legal stuff that you know Kim may want to speak to, but I, I mean, long as I'm not going to Hawaii and doing my thing, okay. Um, but and, and I would just have to, I'm gonna have to defer just a little bit. I'm only thinking historically. I'll re, I'll research it, Commissioner Robinson. I, I'm not aware of a specific policy that you right. have in place. I think what has happened is administratively, whenever there were issues in the past in other counties. The county administrator at the time pulled cards mm -hmm. to make sure their number maybe didn't have any. I didn't know that we had directors with credit cards, so I don't know. Right. But we'll be glad to look into it and see whatever y'all want me to. But I don't. I don't think there's anything wrong with it, the use of cards for efficiency. Oh yeah, yeah. I just think you need to probably have the signature like we talked about earlier. You need to have a policy in place of how the card is to be used typically. Uh, for, for expenses. For expenses, yes. right. Right. So so whether it's coffee and conversation or hotel or whatever the case may be, because I think right. we had a credit card at that time at the hotel, we wouldn't have this issue of, you know, abating the taxes <coughs> or not. The, the issue on reconciliation is going to be this. Okay. Right now, y'all get to $300 a month. Okay. Up to $300 a month, which y'all approve on your agenda. Okay. Your outside expenses are 100% if it's outside the county. And it's approved by the board. So what you see typically is a breakdown in county and out of county. It, you're just somebody will have to for staff reconcile the credit card to match the approvals mm -hmm. because right. otherwise then you'll have a problem uh, when the auditor comes. But that's the only, I don't see any. I don't see any logistical headaches. So, so, it's just a step, right? So, so, so that's right. It's so, just a step. So our approval, if I'm doing my math correct, would be thirty-six hundred dollars a year annually. No. Your approval will be monthly on each expense, each monthly meeting. Y'all approve expenses for the month. Well, I mean, you will approve it monthly, but the overall would be for whatever the, the, the annual meeting. Because one month it could be a coffee conversation for me. I can speak for the other guys. Uh, uh, could be buying the mugs. That sometime I run into those kind of issues where the mugs cost X. I've got a town hall meeting as well, so three hundred dollars would put me at you know, a, a loss, meaning I still did the meeting with the additional cost of $100 or whatever it was because of the timing of a meeting. So I need to make sure we're clear. So are we saying 36 as the annual a lot. credit, you know, okay. a, a limit okay. versus $300 that we got to account for each month? Yeah, you can't spend more that you get recouped from the county more than three hundred dollars a month for in county that's expenses. What you're right. Now that's what the okay. statute yeah. says. Okay. Y'all have a local legislation that says that. What what I'm saying is if you're trying to calculate how much authority should be on the card, you're right, three hundred times twelve is thirty six hundred. Right. Plus probably some leeway for those out of county times when you're traveling and you're spending a hundred percent. Right. And I think that out of town is normally kind of scheduled well in advance and I think that part of the be pretty well easy. I think this one, well, I want to make sure that we all clear as to what that really is. Because if it isn't, then I mean, we're back to where we were. Let me, let me okay. Let me okay. Wait. The, 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 the $300, and it's, we, we, we got light here recently. The $300 is, is per month, mm -hmm. right? But there is nothing in the state law that says that 
use or lose per month. Oh. There is nothing in the law mm -hmm. that says that. So if I don't spend 300 in January, okay, that means now I'm, it's February, that means it's, it's 600. To 3,600. Right. That's, and that's what I'm getting at. So, it's, it's 600. so I'm speaking of the 36. Okay. I know, say what they call no, 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 no. So okay. if I don't use nothing in January, mm -hmm. and it's now February, mm -hmm. I got 600 to work with. Because it's 300 per month Thanks for the that's clarity. allocated over time, like uh -huh. any other budget. Like Jennifer allocates the budget to departments, you can't get ahead until your money has accrued, accumulated, <clears throat> correct? I got you. So um, I spent the 600, all right? So now I'm in March. Got it. I only got what? Three. 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 Yeah. And, and on, uh, then the next two months, I go, I don't spend anything. Wait. Well, then, your math is good. And, and so we keep going. So my, my, let, 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 let me let, no, no. let me jump in. I'm not. Let me I, when you get it when you want me to. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I want to clarify mm -hmm. something that has been said that was erroneous. That I found and that was that you use or lose. There is no monthly use or lose. It's three hundreds per month on a fiscal year, which in our case is thirty six hundred per year. 300 per month times 12 is 3,600. This use of food, so there was, it, was a, it was an improper administrative control that says, well, you get $300 and it's just per month. And, 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 and I obviously got additional counsel said, well, who translated that? The state law doesn't say that you guys have a use or lose $300 per month. Well, I'm clear now. I mean, but I'm, so, Ken, that was my only point. I want to get that right there. This is okay because they've been within this county. A control mechanism says, "Well, I, I translate this this way," and I was like, "Okay, that's not right." Ken. Well, I don't think anybody's ever asked me for that opinion. Not so, you, though. Right. You good? Well, okay. here, here, I'm just going to read the local legislation, I so you know, it. and I'm going to put one caveat that is of, of interest, and I'll okay. explain that why. Mm -hmm. um, the, the law says for y'all, the members of the board shall al also be paid for expenses incurred on official business for the county up to a total of $300 per month, and all members shall be paid actual expenses incurred in carrying on county business while outside the county. Expenses of all board members shall be subject to the approval of the entire board and shall be paid on the basis of actu actual expenditures documented by receipts, blah, blah, blah. And it says this. All expenses shall be paid from the funds of the county on a monthly basis. And the only, I don't have a problem in concept with 300 becoming 3,600, but what I do have a problem is there will be a problem if you have a commissioner removed from office or dies before the year's out and spends all $3,600 in the first two months, that will violate this provision. So you really can't, you gotta be careful because the way this, and I'm not saying it's written great. This is old, this has been, we've been carrying this language probably since the 70s, I'm gonna say, I didn't write it. But if you look at it, it's supposed to be up to, it's not 300 per month, it's up to, which means it could be less. It also is supposed to be paid on a monthly basis. And so I'm not reading anything that, the gray area, I say I agree with you, Commissioner, but there would be a problem if a commissioner in the first quarter spent 3600 bucks and then was removed from office, they would owe the county some money. Right. That's and what I would say. And they'd be in jail probably. They did something improper. Yeah, so yes. not, we, well, could they could do, die, though. They could not do anything. Okay. Probably they could just die. But, okay, yeah. but that's extreme. I, I got it. I, I don't want, of course, there's anything in the law. You can apply a case study, a, a, case, a scenario to, to but, but back to where we were. Right. We, we understand that. Do we understand what we're saying? Mm -hmm. Commissioner, can I add one more thing? You know, because you're in the finance uh, chairman, that what's actually happening is those 300 are being budgeted for the year in y'all slots, right? And and we do allow, and this is to your point, I think, we do allow folks to spend money outside of monthly basis. In other words, it's carry in departments, right? So I can see the argument that if the board approves to up to $3,600 $3, on an annual basis mm -hmm. for the board, as long as it's complying with the statute and doesn't exceed that, I can see that being okay and it being spent over mo various months. Mm -hmm. I don't think historically that's the way other administrations have interpreted that, but nobody's ever come to me for an opinion. I just want y'all to okay, say. But here's what is happening. Mm -hmm. we, we both have our own scenario. Mm -hmm. I used to have some pins that used to have um, 
district two pins. <coughs> Remember those pins? Mm -hmm. I yes, had about sir. a thousand of them that I gave all for probably the first eight years. And these were citizen pins and they loved them and stuff. And so it cost about what fifteen hundred bucks because it was a bunch of pins. Maybe it was so much money. That went over the limit. It was no that was my scenario that I went over three hundred dollars. Right? But it, I had room. It was later in the year, but that means I, there was times money I had not used. And so it was done and it was reimbursed and it was no problem. That's my scenario. But my prior administration. Right. But I've always just bid it myself, you know, depending upon strategically how I have these meetings, ongoing gotcha. meetings, coffee conversations, right. however it works out, I just tend to say, you know what, Ali, Sherry, don't worry about it. Just put the three, call a day and keep it moving. That's just kind of how I've always done it. So not understanding that I was understood that you use it or you lose it versus you use it and, and I could pick up the additional cost, you know, depending on because there are some months I don't use any. I don't I don't know that I've been asked that question. Oh not, not that you've been asked. We're not we're not no, no it's, this this not even yeah. even a question to you though. We just only give you a scenario as to how things tend to happen. And then we went down to Tifton and couldn't even get the credit from the, the tax credit. Right. Uh, because I because it was a shock to me because I've never been anywhere where I had to have a credit card. Uh, a county credit card or not. It's always been, okay, I'm using my credit card, I'll swipe it, we're good, we'll move on, it's over and done. So. Well, and the great line is this, I guess, and I'm saying gray, because <coughs> this, these are just opinions of Ken, that it's not written that here's the, here's the actual, here's, that question has this answer, it probably has multiple answers that you're talking to, but if the, if the board, and I'm saying this, if the board strategically, we're going to have two meetings a year in district one, two or three or one a quarter. I don't know that that's actual, a, 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 I don't know that that's not in the classification of could Rick's department put on a town hall meeting or is right. that an actual and, expense of Henry? Exactly, you follow exactly. What I'm saying? but in other words, always, we've always, always have incurred that cost and, well, and, and floated the cost over to the next. The, the, there's an expenses. argument, right. there's an argument to be made mm -hmm that when you're having meeting events with citizens mm -hmm. in districts, mm -hmm. you're carrying on the function of government. Mm -hmm. And so that's okay. not necessarily an expense to y'all, that's an expense of government that's that's why it's outside that $300. But that's that's why we get the credit cards and, and, and understand these numbers are what they are. And we can clearly... Well, so, so, you, don't get in, no. so, so you don't get in the gray area. Okay. What I would suggest is this, and I don't know how many meetings, I know y'all have a lot of meetings, yeah. I don't know how many, but if you had a baseline and said communication is going in their budget going to put on a meeting every semi-annual in each I district know, or whatever, that would and be a communications budget. And let them pull that out the of budget, that, and right. then we keep our three. But because but then you're not having you're not violating the condition of approval of the expense requirement of this three hundred dollars in the statute. Does I, that make I, sense? I, I get you, but I just I, I just. I think it's the flexibility. For example, I've had times where, okay, I got to pay $300 to use the conference center. This is prior to the current county administrator. Mm -hmm. Like, well, we, you, you got to pick that. Like, why I got to pick that up? You had some political partisanship, Ken, if you knew that it was happening back then. I'm not going to run from that. All right. And you, you, we use this as a tool to, to sort of prohibit movement by the commission. Right? Mm -hmm. Put that to the side. Mm -hmm. All right. So, I mean, my point is, okay, I got $300. I'll make this work. The Hilton Hotel cost me $300. I don't need approval. I don't need nobody's permission. Exactly right. right. I have an office. Mm -hmm. I'm elected. I'm moving. Okay. Right. Um, if, if Palmer Falls doesn't have a clubhouse, I got it, guys. It's just me that the Hilton and I worry about that, whether I pick it up or not. I shouldn't have to, but I'm trying to accommodate my citizens. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of things I do that I'm accommodating that I just don't get spotted back for. I just Same like, here. okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. At some point, and I said, I've always said, I'm going to come back to this. Mm -hmm. Because it was it was a prohibition on commissioners that was, it was at a time where, you, because you could get away with it. Now, it's flipped. It's like, no, I'm not settling for this prohibition that's like, man, why? I mean, I'm, I should be able to operate on behalf of my citizens. Um, and, and, and be free to do so without some type of implied overlay that, that restricts. Mm -hmm. Second point is, for example, when you guys do your mileage, right? You get reimbursed for your miles when you drive mm -hmm. and so forth. You get your ticket, right? Mm -hmm. and they charge it. Where do they charge it? Wherever they travel. Mm -hmm. They charge to your account to travel or mm -hmm. outside county, right? Well, yes. It, it's travel. Yes. yes. It, it's, you travel. Mm -hmm. Well, see, for me, they charge you back to my account. And it's like, that was... I got a letter. Can you get that outside legal attorney on that thing? 
right? This is dealing with my disability. Mm -hmm. Now, that was another move that was like, okay, but you're not being consistent. This goes back to employment. You charge my low cares that way. Mm -hmm. You charge mine this way. It's like, well, why do you have an inconsistent practice? Right, so then what you're doing is clogging up Commissioner Robinson's account mm -hmm. through stuff that, well, everybody else doesn't have to suffer from. You guys are getting picked up through every, you know, your normal wherever you put mileage at, mm -hmm. but you're pushing your mileage into mine, which is compromising my capacity to be able to engage my citizens. So it's like, how interesting, right? And so again, one more time, so we're trying to undo some stuff that was done administratively. Okay, Sam, I'm gonna do it to you, you know, I'm like, bro. Because administratively, just like, no, I'm gonna go come back to this. Mm -hmm. These were political moves that were inappropriate, and it was just like, wow, would you, why would you do a city, like, if you treat me like that, well, how would you treat a whole district? Like, wow, like, you, 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 I have a disability, and you're gonna punish me and, and not allow me and, and, and push this in here? You're gonna compromise him? Like, okay, I'm gonna come back to that. And so here we are, about five years later, and so we're in a different place now. And so it's stuff like that, Ken, that a lot, I mean, think about it, we're sitting here spending half an hour on something like this, over $300. And I, and I think it's really, un, we should, we, are we clear? We really need to move on beyond. Oh, I'm, I, I'm, I clear. Think we're, okay, I'm, I'm clear that we were open with the, 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 the full amount. Uh, be careful as to where and how we use it beyond the $300 mark. Um, and we'll have a card if we need it. We'll use it if we don't, we don't. We have to request it, like they said, so put it in writing that you actually authorize it. Nobody's just issuing cars for the heck of it. Somebody don't want a car and they don't have to get a car, but I thought we agreed that at least we was putting it in writing that we did request one. I don't even see what that means, but I can, but I can live with that. You know, I don't have an issue with making a request that I'd like to have a car accessible, not that I need it with me, but I'd like to have one accessible. Will, will it dominate? Will it dominate to all the department heads and all the other elected officials. No. Mm -hmm. you know, because right now we only have two people that has a car. That's I know, but if we market. request it, is it going to open up the, the door? Well, Y'all are the governing body. Y'all yeah, so are so different. different. Yeah. 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 So I'm, this is focusing directly on the Board of Commissioners and what I'm looking at. First of all, I'm surprised that this conversation had occurred before my administration, but I'm anxious and excited to entertain it because that do not uh, lose, you know, use us or uh, lose it's not in any, you wouldn't be able to use your $3,600 using that policy use or lose because you'd never, your $3,600 will never be used. So that cap should be removed because, again, the commissioners may want to do something this month that may exceed the $300, may be $500, but they want to use it as long at the, at the end of the uh, day when we look at our budgets at the end of the year because it's annualized, it, it does not exceed that $3,600. I'm okay with it. I just because I want to make sure. Well, he uh, was reading the way he read that, or what you read. It sounded like we were capped in at three hundred a month. Is it? It a never said thirty six hundred. Yeah, it doesn't say per year. It says three hundred a month, and it says and paid on a monthly that. basis. Oh. And so the question: What does that mean? It says all expenses shall be paid from the funds of the county on a monthly basis. Right. Yeah. And so it'll be reimbursed for yeah. expenses that we did. So just well, outside the county. You know, so, but I think in, I think in spirit yeah. that if y'all are budgeting three hundred per commissioner up to per month per month in the financial fiscal cycle, yeah. and during that cycle you're within that number. It's half a dozen one, two dozen another. I can't say with a hundred percent certainty. How this is how this is written. What I can say, it implies that it's three hundred dollars and it's paid on a monthly basis. But those are separated, and I think that's just when the reimbursement occurs Correct. on a monthly basis. So the only issue I see is someone not fulfilling the term of office or fiscal cycle, having pre-spent money. How do you get it back? That's the only caveat to anything I would add. That that's the only. It's, it's like this. Yes, we just we, we our, 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 attorney, our employees at my office uh, participate in a retirement program and it accrues. Well, if we, and we fully fund it ourselves, the lawyers, the, the part the company. If the company prepays somebody and they leave before the end of a year, 
We don't have a way to get that money back. Yeah. Potential. Yeah. Yeah. There's no difference if somebody yeah. takes an asset out of this county like a computer or anything else. You you pay it back, you give it back. This is nothing new in yeah. business, guys. Don't make you know, and, and Commissioner, I'm not arguing you with you. Put you, know, notice, you know what I'm saying? You yeah. put a notice on them, say give it back, and if you right. if they're gone, like and we've had that. whatever. Like, yes, we have. <laughs> we've had we, we've had we've had reimbursements for education, and we had to go pursue the people out in another state right. to get the money back. Yeah, yeah. Because if you could, um, county attorney, if you could just do some research for me, because it's condescending. It says up to three hundred, and then it says not to exceed thirty six hundred a year. What is it? I mean, they got to. Well, it doesn't say not to exceed. It only exactly says three hundred a month. month right. But up to three hundred, up to. Three hundred a month. I said no thirty six. Reimbursement on a monthly basis. Okay. The thirty six comes from people doing months. math. Yeah. But you don't lose. It's no. It does not tell you that you lose your three hundred dollars. That's correct. Right. It doesn't. And that's where we, when we're going through our process that we just went through that we learned. Like we told y'all that y'all lose your three hundred dollars. It says we up to. It means you can do less. Can do less, but it, 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 uh, to me, right. you do it's, lose it. <laughs> well, I agree with what commissioners. Commissioners say if I spend ten dollars in this month. And I spend 590 the next month, and it still adds up to six over two, exactly. months, over two months. And I'm still a commissioner. What difference does it make? It's probably no harm, no foul. I would, I would agree. So can we change the language? Well, two ways you can change it. And Commissioner Robinson and I have had a discussion about this. One is the state legislature. That's, that's not, no, but we're not increasing we anything. Right, we're not increasing. I don't think there's an increase. Change. This is not. This is just. This is administration. This is internal. But to his point that if you don't have it in writing who's to say you know we can recoup those funds who's to, if that's not in writing somebody can argue this all day mm -hmm. right that's, the problem. Mm -hmm. that's a problem which is the whole point which is it's up to you at the local level to establish um, your own internal rules and policy <laughs> if, if we were looked at like you guys ain't figured this out yet? Who is counseling y'all? Who is translating your capacity? The law does not say that you lose it. You can't, I mean, and it's like, it's too, like, God, what are y'all afraid of? It's it like, just it's up to 300. That un understood. It, I'm not, we're not talking about that. We're talking about the capacity that says that every month is $300, right? Up to $300. It doesn't matter, but it's, you, you have that capacity. Mm -hmm. You have a capacity up to $300. And so if I don't use my full capacity in the first month, I didn't lose that capacity. That capacity is there in the second month. So now it's aggregated. It doesn't say you don't have the aggregation, nor does it say you do. I'm coming back to the, I got these attorneys up there saying, who's counseling y'all that y'all can't figure this out? Yeah. This ain't hard. And it's like, we, we didn't set up here, it's political capital over something like, this is like y'all acting amateur that y'all can't. I mean, I got rebuked. And it was like, no, I take it. But like, I, I got this. This is not hard. And what are we afraid of that we can't establish something over $300 per month? Right? This, this up to $300 per month. It's your local rules, your local policy. The law didn't say that we, that don't, no, nobody's prohibiting you. So why are you saying that you can't do it? It will either enable you or prohibit you. And so we saying that you, you, your look, this is what your local delegation says. Okay, wrap your policies at a local level or under that and keep moving. But that, that's all you need. We're not asking for an increase. We're staying with what's already on the books today. We're just aligning our local policy to match what the delegation has already given us. That, not a public meeting. That's like, okay, that's just a county. You already got the authority. All we're talking about right now is simply using a credit card to facilitate what's already there. You don't have to float my money anymore, so I'd I, I love to. Right. Make up. Right. <laughs> that's, that's all we're talking about. We're just we're, we're just matching a tool that's already on the uh, already within the county against an amount that's already on the books. That's all we're talking and, about. And we're accounting for all that you swipe and or deal with. So I, I mean, I, I do that now anyway. Yeah, yeah. I, I just all I'm saying with respect to that um, We're good. Yeah, is you the, po the policy has to be if there is policies, it's not administrative because Mark can impose administrative policies on the people that oversee him. Okay. And so, if y'all are right. going to have policies, y'all are the ones that have to approve it, not Mark. 
Right. Yes. Right. Yes. Which, he can't, which yeah. we don't need his permission well, to get a car. So let me ask you about it. Yeah. 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 All right. So, all right. I'm good. Commissioner, so, you good? Yeah. So, Lisa, this, this is my notice. Sir. This is my notice. <laughs> Okay, you know, right. this, this, is, this is my notice, yes. We're still okay. on the record. Yeah, we're still on the record. This is my notice. Oh, I, got, I got one question. I, I found out that the board, the appraisal department, they don't get annual training anymore. And I don't understand that because the laws change so much with appraisals than Why anything. Don't they? Why don't they? They don't have to annual budget or something? They don't. Then we the, follow the budget? department head or heads or whoever it is does not put it in the budget and won't allow them to go but i'm telling you laws change i thought they had to be certified anyway you have to have so much continuing education they, they do the certification but they they don't get to go uh, catch up on the new laws and the continuing the education uh -huh. is that what you're saying that but well, wouldn't that be a part of their the department head requests it wouldn't be something I mean, I'm saying the department head does not request it in their budget, okay, but, but it's hurting the county because no, I agree. I'm with you though. But, but <laughs> I think they may be doing some things that they're not supposed to be doing. Okay. And, and I, 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 would, I would agree, but I'm just saying, wouldn't the, the department head and or Mark say, hey guys, we need to be trained once a month, I, mean, I don't know, annually, twice a year? I don't know what the numbers are. So they that, used to always have it. One, one. Just like the tax commissioners' mm -hmm. association, right. you know. Okay. I, agree. I, I mean, I, I'll follow the law to make sure we incorporate the training. I'm did questioning. you know about it? I, I did, and and you, but they're but they run it on such a very tight budget. Okay, so it's, it's the, so they're going to spend their money as opposed to training. They're going to spend the money on the just high personnel or someplace else on pins and. and <laughs> I, I don't know. I, it really is a, it, 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 I'll just say this. We just gave back thirty thousand mm -hmm. dollars. They needed twenty five thousand real for, estate. And that's on the, real the estate. Correct. They didn't have the twenty five thousand dollars in their budget to handle that. How do you think they would have money to handle training? So it's when, they just get, the, when we have an issue like that and they give back thirty thousand dollars, it comes out of their budget. No, it didn't. Because of this, yeah, it's coming out of the taxes. It's been that's paid correct. To us. That's, I'm talking about their budget. <laughs> but but I get it. But okay. I'm saying if they didn't have twenty five thousand dollars to keep us, then I'll say it this way: to keep us from reimbursing thirty thousand dollars, how do you think they have money for training? It's just not feasible. You have to those budgets that they run over there. Is, and, and this is just me. There are three departments that we have board of commissioners really should look at fully funding: sheriffs because of security. We have tax commissioner because he goes and gets the money. Board of assessors because they go and appraise so that we will have it to give to the tax commissioner so that he can go get the money. Okay. Those three departments are very, very, very closely. I'm going to, uh, we'll make an. I'll talk to Mark and we'll see what we can do too. We may have to pull it out of our, and we will, um, out of our um, contingency for the 25000 because I want to make sure I get this this component so we don't continue to give those big dollars back. But also I need those appraisers to get up from those desks and go out yeah. to those places. Right. So they're doing more right. talking than they are walking. Mm -hmm. So I need them to get up from their they chairs. because yeah, yeah, and, and Yeah, from the yes. seat, they need to get up. Mm -hmm. So we'll, but we, we're going to step on the limb and get this $25,000 um, uh, component of technology, but they still, technology does not replace physical bodies to get up and look at it. And some of them are not going out there based on tax commissioners, previous ones, and current ones. That this is just out. one episode. I mean, we'll have them all year. Mm -hmm. We'll have the... Okay, I'll talk to Mark. We'll, we'll get that component. I'm on, and I'm hoping that it will help move things along. We'll get it. Okay. Oh. Wait, back to software. This time last year, we tried uh, appraising with a new software. They had to undo. Remember, they had to back down because yeah, and that's, and it, was new. Mm -hmm. it was new. Um, did we ever perfect that? I'm trying to, that when I'm hearing add-ons, I'm sorry I missed it. I, I, I had to step out first. I, what I'm trying to get a feel for is we spent when last year we installed new software. We backed down with the um, digest because it was doing the digest. The numbers, they, they're trying to run all over. This is, you have the normal assessment, 
and then you have um, um, based on cash, well, based on revenue, right? Mm -hmm. um, in other words, businesses and stuff. In other mm -hmm. words, you get a more accurate, um, um, you, you're leaving a lot of money on the table because we're doing it the old fashioned That's way. The audit. Yeah. That's the audit, where they audit their inventory. Okay. Okay. We're, we're trying to get a more accurate assessment. Um, and so, I, I guess, or appraisal for that matter, um, it was called an appraisal software. I guess because he said we're doing it the old fashioned way. And I guess my question is, have we matured from this time last year to now? You may not know, but have, have we improved in such a way that going into this year's digest, will it be more accurate or will we want to go through the mistakes that we had to back back out? Remember that whole process of sure we had to back out? Mm -hmm. Have we got any better? Does anybody know? I can't think of that. The way to check well, it is to look at the ENR at the end of the year. When they do reconcile the digest at the yeah. end of the year, yeah. and they'll be due in 2018 very soon. That's why. Right. Look at, and you have to sign the ENRs when they do the uh, mm -hmm. uh, audit for the state. Yeah, the state. That's what I'm saying. Okay. And we all see. need to look at that and see how much of the county funds was written off. Okay. All right. Okay. Duly noted. All right. Can we close? Any other questions? But with that being said. <laughs> This is our journey. All right. All right. That was good.